Today is the 10th of February 2020 and this is a conversation between Emilio Longo and Andrew Bonneau. Andrew, welcome to School Based Art, a learning resource for art students and artist teachers. It's a pleasure to be speaking with you today. Thanks for having me. Fantastic, Andrew. Well, let me begin by introducing you. Andrew, you're a traditional realist painter that was trained in the time-honoured atelier system which stems from the European teaching studios of the 17th through 19th centuries. Born in 1981 in Tasmania, Australia, you have been selected as a finalist for multiple national painting awards, which include the Adelaide Perry Drawing Prize, the Stanford Regional Gallery Prize, the Benalla Nude Art Prize, the Percival National Portrait Prize, and the Shirley Hanna National Portrait Prize. The AME Bale Travelling Scholarship and Art Prize has seen you twice as a finalist and you are a regular finalist in the Doug Moran National Portrait Prize, which you have been selected for on three occasions. In 2017, you were selected as a finalist for the Archibald Prize, and in the past, you have been commissioned by the National Portrait Gallery of Canberra. In 2018, you were awarded the William Fletcher Foundation Rome Residency, which allowed you to spend three months at the British School in Rome studying the work of the European Masters. Your work has been exhibited in both Australia and abroad and is showcased in public and private collections globally. Concerning your upbringing, was art something which was supported in your family? Uh, yeah, I'd say it was. Um, it was something that I had a, I had an uh, inclination to do. I'd, I'd spent a lot of time drawing uh, as a kid. I, I was happy to just be in my room drawing and I was pretty obsessed with uh, trying to um, you know, develop skill and try and try and make make things look real. Sure. Um, my parents didn't really have art education, but they would they did whatever they could to to encourage it. Uh, they'd buy art books uh, when they could. Uh, they they ended up getting an art teacher to come once a week after school for you know private tutoring. Um, so yeah, there was uh, definitely support. Um, I grew up in Cairns, um, and so it's there's not a lot of opportunities for studying with professional artists or getting or getting really good advice. Mm. But um, as much as my parents could do, um, they did. We had we had art books in the house. I remember we had we had books on Leonardo. We had books on Michelangelo and Van Gogh, mm -hmm. William Blake, mm -hmm. um, and you know my mum would always choose. Um, kids books with with good illustrations like she told me that a little while back she'd always make sure the the, the pictures were, were were really beautiful and, and well done sure so i think even from an early age just being exposed to that mm -hmm. um you absorb it and you and, and it teaches you to tell the difference between what's 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 really beautifully done and what and what isn't mm -hmm. you know, I, I think um the exposure is is crucial sure so, yeah it was, it was encouraged for sure Fantastic. Yeah. So, were some of those illustrations you'd uh, encounter in those books things that you'd try to replicate in your own drawings? Uh, yeah, I think so. Um, I, I remember uh, there's an illustrator called Graham Bass. I don't know if you know his work. Mm. Um, he's still illustrating, but uh, he, he did some really good books in the 80s, uh, Animalia and The Eleventh Hour. Um, mm. These were, you know, really detailed, uh, really detailed, I guess, pencil drawings of, of animals in, in all kinds of different situations. and. Um, a lot of hidden, a lot of hidden things in the pictures. Um, so yeah, things that tended—I don't know when I look back on it—things that tended towards realism, I, I was attracted to. Um, and then later on, it was uh, comics. You know, I was into the Phantom, mm -hmm. and um, I'd, I'd copy that. I'd copy, I'd copy uh, Marvel comics and all that. You know, all that stuff. So, sure. Yeah. So, yeah. I'd, I'd, yeah. Examples. You tend to copy the good examples if you can. Yeah, and yeah. it's interesting because a lot of realists, uh, when you look at their their uh, history and the development, uh, a lot of them started you know as copying things from comic books yeah. and being fascinated by Spider Man, yeah. you know, dynamic anatomy, sure. that Hogarthian sure. kind of uh, anatomy that's right. emphasized and pushed right, right, beyond right. naturalism. Sure, sure, sure. And it's from there it's. Uh, sort of, you know, you're looking for the, the next sort of uh, best thing that kind of fits yes. into that mold of realistic uh, superhero kind of dynamic anatomy and then eventually you get led to looking at Renaissance drawings and such. That's true. Um, I think, yeah, because all of those um, comic book artists are extremely well trained, you know, they've, they've, 
that they've studied the human body, they, they can draw the figure from any position, uh, from imagination. And there's a tradition of that, you know, it goes, it does go back to the Renaissance. And so uh, if you're exposed to art history or you go to art school or you, you go to museums, you, you put, you put those things together and you realize, okay, well, this is, this is an older, older tradition. And um, depending on where you want to go with your, your interest and your, your temperament and your, and your, and your work, uh, you'll either want to stay with that the, the comic world aspect of it, uh, which which is its own which is its own thing, or you might um, want to turn turn to this you know where that started from. And, and I remember a key moment of of that when I was at art school, um, looking at Raphael, looking at books of Raphael, and realizing okay, this there's a there's there's commercial art and there's illustration and um, there's many forms that this language can take. But there's something, uh, I guess you'd say, in a, in its pure form, it, it's for it's for its own sake, and it's it's in the service of beauty as as the, as the goal. Mm. And I remember set, just seeing particular Raphael paintings, and it just struck me. I was like, okay, that's 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 what I want to aim at. It's that, it it's that thing, not for any other reason, but but for 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 the sake of beauty in it in itself. Wow. If that makes sense, sure. I don't know if that makes sense, but but just that 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 level of um, just deciding that you know there's there's different paths you can take right in in the visu- in the visual arts sure you sure know, fantastic you know, there's, there's a, yeah so now at what point in your life did you realize that you want to start to take art seriously? Uh, well, that was a key moment, the one I just described. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's been a few. Um, uh, I was I was. It was pretty clear in high school that um, that I wanted to study art when mm-hmm. I left. Um, I moved to Sydney in, um, I think it was 2000, yes, when the Olympics were on, just okay. 2000. Uh, I got accepted into National Art School, mm-hmm. uh, but I was, you know, I was 18. Or, mm. Yeah, I was 18, so I, I, didn't, I didn't know anything. Sure. Uh, I, knew, I knew I wanted to learn how to draw better. I was pretty good at drawing, but I wanted to do life drawing and wanted to learn whatever they had to teach me. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, and so you can be doing something and be unconscious about why you're doing it, but you're doing it anyway and you're in the right place. Mm. And then it might dawn on you, okay, oh, right, I'm, I'm actually um, doing this purposefully now. So I think, I think there were a few key moments when I was at, when I was at National Arts School uh, that, I, that I realized, okay, this is, this is the path now. I'm on this path and I'm, I'm going to continue. Mm. Um, and then it was a matter of, uh, I did further study and it was a matter of choosing um, exactly which direction to go in because, uh, you know, going to, going to art schools can be, uh, uh, I'd say, disorienting to say the least. Mm. You get exposed to a lot of things, but you don't always know where you want to go. So Exactly. Yeah, that's, sure. that's it's a common story. You know? Sure. Yeah, you've, you've been through that too. Mm. Yeah. It's true. Yeah. So you mentioned that you were exposed to these books on Leonardo and yeah. you're looking at some of the books by some of the uh, Marvel illustrators and such. So at what point, I mean, what, what is your earliest memory, really, of the, of the realist tradition where you looked at a work and you said, you know, wow, that's something that I would love to do? Ah, uh, good question. Um, it's hard to know if it's, it's one thing. Um, so many, so, I'm just all these images of <laughs> things I've looked at when I was a kid sure, coming yeah. up. Um, I don't know if you remember. There was this uh, series of, uh, of of magazines you could get. It was called the Great Artist Series. Oh yeah. In the night yeah. in the nineties, I think. Yeah, yeah. You could collect them all. There was like a hundred. Mm, mm. So it was a little short, really thin uh, little magazine, yeah. one on each artist. <laughs> so we used to collect them, but we didn't have all of them. But um, I know we had Michelangelo, we had Van Gogh, we had Gauguin, we had El Greco, mm. we had. Uh, we had William Blake in the house. I don't know if it was from that, but we it was William Blake pictures around. Um, I don't know if it was a particular picture, but um, I mean, I remember I remember cop- doing a copy of a Rembrandt when I was in high school. I remember copying Michelangelo, not very well. Mm. Um, I can't think of one. I can't think of one particular point, but it was. Um, it was a. I think it was an attraction that was always there. I don't. Okay. I think it was there anyway. Okay. I think it was there anyway. And yeah. Then, and and I've often thought about this. It's it's as if um, you you have a you have a sort of tendency 
toward nature and to, mm. to try to draw nature, um, which is, you know, is it innate or are we enculturated because we've seen old master paintings and we know it's possible to do that? Mm. It's a combination of both. Sure. It's like a nature nurture debate. Mm. So, that, you know, you have exposure, but then you feel like it's natural that you want to draw the world. Yeah. Um, and it feels natural. Sure. But maybe that was awakened by seeing by seeing art. Mm. So I, I think I think it's both of those influences were always there. Right. Sure. Yeah. I, I don't know. You got you're going a bit too far back into my memory, <laughs> so I don't know. That's <laughs> interesting. So what, what were your uh, what were your art, your high school art classes like? Were they uh, you know did they teach some sort of solid foundational yeah, skills? It was okay. I mean, I I ended up I ended up doing mostly art at high school. I ended up dropping a lot of other subjects. Okay. Um, I changed high schools in um, uh, in year uh, for year eleven and twelve, so because oh, right. I had a special art program, so I went to oh, the other art school. So yeah, it was good. I got to do I got to do a lot of art. They had good materials. They had, um, but um, it was more to do with uh, you know developing ideas and things like that. It wasn't necessarily skill based. Whatever mm. whatever observational skills I had were probably just from practice mm -hmm. and from uh, you know whatever's. Uh, yeah, copying uh, other things or, or whatever's whatever comes naturally. Mm -hmm. But the art I was doing in high school was, um, you know, it was it was kind of psychedelic. It was kind mm -hmm. of uh, kind of mystical. Yeah. Um, it's related to the music I was into and the other kinds of influences at the time. You know, sure. I was uh, I was kind of into into surrealism and mm. uh, things like that. So uh, it's um, it's kind of different from what I'm doing now. Um, mm. But I did. We did have a lot of time to do art in high school. Great. That was good. Yeah. Great. Do you yeah. still have those early examples? Yeah, I got a few. I got oh. a few uh, still at home. Fantastic. Uh, Fantastic. <laughs> they'll be they'll be unveiled uh, <laughs> at some point. <laughs> yeah. Uh, your early works. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Now I understand Kimon Nicoletti's book, The Natural Way to Draw, was of help to you in your formative years. Yes. Can you explain how this book impacted your training? Okay, well, so I was at I was at National Art School. Uh, we had life drawing um, a, so a few, I don't know, a couple of times a week, mm -hmm. I guess. Then I was doing a painting major where you you're doing your own work, whatever that happens to be. Uh, and then I'd go to life drawing classes at night. Um, not really classes, I just sort of sketching, you know, mm -hmm. untutored. Uh, then when I finished, uh, I went to study with Charlie Sheard. Uh, we'll probably talk about that. But he actually introduced me to that book, The Natural Way to Draw. Okay. Um, so, for people who aren't familiar with it, I mean, he covers a lot of he covers a lot of different things, but two of the main ones are gesture drawing and um, blind contour drawing. Mm. So, the gesture drawing, I guess you, you're you're thinking about the the energy of the figure. Um, Nicolaitis talks about. Um, you draw what the person is doing, not what they look like. Sure. So you're guided by the action. Mm -hmm. uh, and contour drawing or blind contour drawing is about the external form, mm. the surface. You're running, you're running um, your pencil over the over the surface of the form, uh, and you're you're being sensitive to every uh, every indentation and every protuberance of, of bone and muscle. Yeah. Uh, so you've got the sort of the inner life and the outer. Um, you know the, the form, mm. right? It's it's a kind of uh, nice dichotomy. Mm. Um, that well, not dichotomy. They, they they work together, don't they? They seem. Yeah. Um, so I, I when I when I started studying with Charlie, I just committed myself to that book as in my own practice. So I'd, I'd go, I'd do life drawing at night, uh, and on on days when I wasn't doing anything else, um, he recommends that you do sort of a three hour session. And you do what, like twenty one minute poses, then you do maybe a half an hour gesture drawing, and then a forty minute some other drawing. Then you do twenty more one minute poses, then you do a long gesture uh, contour drawing, and the the program would last for a year. If you're drawing five days a week, it'll last you for a year. Wow, you know, okay. that, that's that's yeah. how he set up the book, and he introduces other things like um, drawing with uh, crayon to develop a sense of mass and things like that. So I think. Uh, I was committed to I was committed to that program and I, I followed it to the word. I, I only got, probably got about three quarters of the way through the book. Okay. But I I, I did it like religiously. Um, at the same time, I started to realize that there was a missing piece in the book, um, which mm. was, I guess, it relates to the demonstration I was doing before in the early stages of a drawing when you 
you need to realize that uh, when you're looking at something, uh, it's from one point of view, right? Mm -hmm. And so it, it will appear as a, as a flat image in one sense. Mm -hmm. Obviously, that, that's, a, that's an abstraction, like the world isn't flat. Mm -hmm. It's three-dimensional, and you want to convey that. But in order to get proportions, you need to imagine that it's flat. Mm -hmm. It was described to me like a, like a piece of glass is, is in front, and you, you're, you're, you're sort of tracing, mm. you know, the, the, yeah. the image like that. That's an Albertian uh, theory as well. Yeah, it goes, it goes, right, back, it goes right back to the Renaissance. There, mm. there are drawings uh, by, by Dürer as well of, of, of uh, you know, the, the grid mm. with string. Mm. You, um, yeah, you, it's, it's, it's an illusion mm. that allows you to see the, see the world as it appears. Sure. Nicolaides didn't uh, address that. And so I would find I'd be developing drawings with good gesture, a good sense of volume. I was even introducing like cubic forms and mm. cylindrical forms and things. But a, a little bit of the way into the drawing, um, the spaces would be too big between points. Okay. Or they'd be too squashed. And I was already thinking three dimensionally and, mm. and in terms of volume, mm. uh, and and then I'd realised well I didn't I didn't get proportions right at the beginning and so that kind of frustrated me because I wanted I wanted the proportions to be to be right especially if you want to draw portraits sure like that. sure and so I kind of um, I kind of moved away from Nicolaides a little bit and mm. uh, started drawing from casts that's wow. why I really started doing cast drawing because I thought that'll teach me how to do. How to do the proportions? Sure, so, uh, sure. And yeah, I was I was doing uh, I was going to Julian Ashton at night, um, uh, doing life drawing, and I eventually decided to um, uh, enroll in a cast drawing class there. Wow. Okay. So, so yeah, because I was just sort of hanging around and drawing, and then I, I actually said, okay, I'm going to come in and you know submit myself to to some rigorous uh, teaching. So sure. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Great. So, did, just going back to uh, your beginnings in, as, a, as a teenager drawing, do you feel like you always had a natural inclination to a really sensitive drawing, the, the, kind of, uh, the kind of work that's conducive of the kind of academic tradition, the academic drawings that we now admire? Yeah, I think so. Um, yeah, but, but, but on the other hand, there were things that I liked that weren't like that, you know. Mm -hmm. um, I remember looking in a in a book of um, I think nineteenth century painting and and looking at Kandinsky and being like wow that's great looking at Gauguin and thinking wow the color and the the flatness of the color and the the weight of it and then in the same book looking at um, someone like Gustave Moreau and the kind of the, the 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 tonal the tonal space that he creates and thinking wow that's that's also really good mm. you know the, the you, I'm always uh, interested in lots of different things, and um, and I like Matisse as well. I, you know, I still like these things, but um, but yeah, the um, the tendency towards uh, towards careful drawing and and like the the observed world and the sensitivity to the observed world. Um, yeah, I mean, it was it was always kind of a, a, an aim. You know, mm -hmm. um, that that never went away. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's um, yeah, that's kind of a central thing, I suppose. Sure, yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. So were you always one of those kids that could draw really well? Just yeah, innately? I was. I was a good drawer in the class. Mm. Yeah, and it, it made me a bit arrogant because I was the best drawer mm. in the class, and like and probably in other classes too. And uh, you know when you when you're good and you don't have anyone around you who's better, you sort of think you know it all, <laughs> you know. So uh, mm. um, I'm glad I got exposed to later on, later on seeing uh, people that were better and realizing, okay, I'm, I'm I might be good, but I'm not actually that good. Sure. There's a long way to go. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I was I was yeah I was I was a good drawer in school. Sure. People people would get me to do their projects. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. sure. Um, I don't know why I didn't charge them money for it. But yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, yeah, that was that was my thing. Great. Yeah. yeah Great. Yeah, yeah. Now, eventually, you discovered the Charles Barg and Jean Leon Jerome drawing course, and you copied many of the plates. Yeah. Now, for those of the, uh, for, for those listeners or the audience that might not be familiar, the Charles Barg and Jean Leon Jerome drawing course is uh, basically it's a standard academic study for uh, painters in training. Yeah. Learning how to go about the block in sure. and establishing sure. uh, uh, tonal shapes and shadow shapes. Um, really understanding and developing the ability to draw academically. Yeah. So it's working from the flat, 
uh, popping, I think there are about 160 plates yes. in, the, in the drawing yeah. course. Yeah. So eventually you, you found the book. And yeah. um, uh, can I ask how you initially uh, came across the course and in what ways did the drawings, uh, copying the drawings, how did that influence you? How did that help you improve your own drawing? Yeah, well, I mean, the, the thing that I mentioned before that the, the Nicolaitis book lacked, Charles, the Charles Bard course is all about that. Mm. It's all about... Um, you know, breaking breaking the visual world down into, into angles and, and, and shapes and, and measuring uh, distances and proportions. Um, yeah, I was seeking out this training. I mean, it, it was sort of hard to find it, to find things. Uh, I think it was back in 2005, 2006. Mm -hmm. You know, there was, I think the Art Renewal Centre was online at that point. Um, and I found that because of a... Um, uh, Juliet Aristides book I think mm. that had the Art Renewal Centre website on the back of it or something so I looked it up became aware of things and sure. and, I, and, I, and I, I ended up reading a lot of things online um, and I, I read that in the, at, uh, I think it was at the Florence Academy and probably the, um, the lineage of uh, the Richard Lack mm -hmm. school they would copy the, the Charles Bard course and I thought well I want to get it uh, I, looked at, I looked it up it had been published, but it was out of print <laughs> at the time. Yeah. And then I contacted a bookseller and he said, well, it's going to be reprinted soon. Mm. So I put it in order. And so I, I got at like a, yeah, one of the first batch of the, of the research sure. of, the, of the reprint. Was that uh, from the Dahish Museum? Yes, it was. Yeah. Yes, they, it was. they reprinted it. Yeah, yeah. they reprinted it. And sure. Graydon Parish did the, the, um, the description at the back of the mm. size size method. Sure. Um, so yeah, I kind of got that a bit early. Like I, I ended up going to Grand Central Academy and uh, telling someone, I'm like, oh, do you guys know the Charles Bard drawing course? And um, it was Josh LaRock. He said, oh, I've never heard of that. And I went back a year later and they were, t they were using it as part yeah. of their, so it became, it became everywhere. Wow. Uh, I mean, Florence Academy, I think we're always using it. Yeah. They were, they had the lithographs. That's right. But then it became, it, it became a common way uh, for students to learn. And um Rightly so. I mean, it, it has uh, it has its limitations, but it's um, it it used to be that you would have to have copied all the plates in that book before you would even enrol to get into art school. Mm. You know, and then and then you would then you would draw from real casts mm -hmm. for you know a few several months or a year, and then finally the model. Mm -hmm. So you know the standards were were high mm -hmm. uh, in, in the nineteenth century in, in Europe. Mm. Uh, which is what all these these ateliers are based on. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I, I really liked that. Um, I, f I felt like I was getting a piece of the training that that I was looking for. Mm. So I was, I was glad to, to come across it. And I, I was just kind of working on my own. Um, it wasn't until I went to New York that I actually met other people who were trying to pursue this. And it was really exciting to meet mm. them, you know, so... Uh, but yeah, it's just just doing it. Sure. You know, trying to trying to get trying to develop skill. And how many how many plates do you, would you say that you copied throughout the uh, the Charles Bard course? Uh, well, um, when we when I went to New York, we had to do, I think thirty of them, uh, before of of the of the cast drawings. Mm -hmm. And then um, you move on to drawing casts, and then you you copy about thirty of the figures as well. Mm. But um, the, the the different thing that we did at um, at New York was that we we didn't model all the drawings. We just do the the, the blocking stage. You know, there's two okay, stages. Yeah, yeah. There's, there's the schematic, and then there's the the, the, the refined. refined drawing, yeah. yeah. So we would do the first stage. Okay. And that that's that's to do with um, a conception of, of light and and not copying shading, mm. um, because the, the the teaching at, at where I studied at Grand Central Academy. It's about conceptualizing the light source, and it's not about just copying the tones you see. Mm. So Jacob uh, didn't want—he didn't want us to get into the habit of copying tones, mm -hmm. because if you do that with the Charles Bard course, you, that's basically what you're training yourself to do: is sure. just match the tones that he's doing. Mm -hmm. And he wanted us to think about it completely, like um, conceptually. Mm -hmm. You know, um, you establish your own shadow value, you establish your own light value, and you you work between them rather than copying literally like one for one what's there sure so yeah we got 30 of them done quicker than if we modeled them all uh, and then i was doing my own I, I might have done maybe i don't know maybe 15 or something on my own okay um, before that 
Right. So yeah, I was doing it on my own. I thought oh, I'll get a head start before I before I go there, and I when I got there, they made me do them all again anyway. <laughs> so it didn't really matter. Did you find it's, it's good practice to do yeah, it twice? You know, sure. So, Did you find yourself yeah. uh, getting worn out uh, after numerous copies of the bar plates? Uh, look, it's a challenge. I mean, you you accept the challenge. We'd we'd spend about four hours, four to five hours on each one, and you just right. like you just do it. And, sure. uh, and you you do it as good as you can within those th- that time. I mean, you you try to make it right. You mm-hmm. go until it's right, but um, but yeah, you do another one the next day. Sure. You know, you, know, you don't kill yourself like mm. continually um, trying to make it perfect. Sure. I mean, you you do the best you can within that time. Okay. Uh, look, I I I wouldn't want to do too many of them now. It's good practice to do one here and there, but um, you know, it's. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's it's not it's not the most exciting thing in the world. They're they're a little yeah. bit dry. Yeah, some yeah. of them. Yeah. yeah, of course. I mean, it's it's an exercise, right? Right. It's not to do that, but a very yeah. useful one. And whenever whenever students ask me, oh, how can I get better at drawing at home? What exercises should I do? I always recommend that book because um, it's pretty clear what the objective is. You mm-hmm. know, you can um, you can tell if it's if it's correct or not. And um, you work, you work at at your pace. Sure. And you know, once you've done that, you do the next one. So, mm. yeah, it, it's a yeah. The parameters are clear. Sure. I, th- I think it's I think it's a really useful tool. Absolutely, yeah. I agree yeah. with that. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Now, in two thousand and one, your formal art training began at the National Art School in Sydney. What made you decide that you wanted to pursue a Bachelor of Fine Arts at this point in your life? Well, I didn't really know what I was doing. I just knew I wanted to. To, do, to be an artist and study art, and um, that se- that seemed like the most appropriate school. I mean, I, we I looked at some others, and that that one, you know, seemed good. They did life drawing. I, I you know, they seemed like they were going to really teach me. Mm-hmm. Uh, I got accepted into it. That that helps. Um, and yeah, I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm glad I went there. Um, because you know, people don't often know know what to do um, at that at that time. Uh, so you know, people around me were saying, you know, you could be an illustrator or you could be a graphic designer or something, and you learn the skills and then you do something else with it. But that never really interested me. But at the same time, I never really um, until that you know that moment of looking at the Raphael painting. Uh, realized okay this is there's a particular path that I can I can walk down um, yeah I was I, I enjoyed it I mean we, we did we did life drawing I think the first year is really good mm-hmm. because you're, you're learning a lot of skills mm-hmm. the second year you're encouraged to uh, kind of uh, question the, the value of those skills that you've recently acquired or not even acquired Mm -hmm. and by the third year you're meant to be um, already have transcended uh, skill and you're developing genius ideas Mm -hmm. uh, which which it's it's an unrealistic um, you know program by the third year I I was just I was ready to to get out of there because um, um, you get pulled in so many different directions and and it it wasn't it wasn't about the developing skill I I think it you know it used to be a five-year program Mm. The National Art School, mm. wow. and, and it was a diploma. It wasn't even a degree. Wow! And I think that would make sense. You know, five years. You, you know, you, and this was in the uh, I don't know the the first half of the twentieth century. So mm-hmm. modernism hadn't really had much of an influence. Um, so people were learning really, you know, how to how to paint a figure. They were learning anatomy. They were learning um, perspective. They were learning how to sculpt. Mm-hmm. You know, model with clay. Mm-hmm. How to carve. From, from the nude mm-hmm. um, and so they develop uh, pretty good skills and then you know maybe in the last year or so do something original with it mm-hmm. I think that's a more realistic time frame sure. than three years I think three oh, years yeah. is it's too short so um, well especially in it, a university calendar it, yeah I mean, it's more like yeah. you know you get six seven months when you think about the brain you're not getting the whole year yeah exactly not. Yeah. exactly so it's a difficult thing they're trying to do. I mean, they're, they're trying to train you to a degree that you're adequate to, you know, you're good at painting or whatever you're doing. And then they're also introducing modernism, which, which uh, historically has um, challenged those, those skills and mm-hmm. those traditions. Sure. And you're meant to imbibe that. Mm-hmm. And then, um, then postmodernism, 
which uh, is another another problem altogether. Mm-hmm. And then um, originality, uh, mm. it, it's it's a hard thing to, to to manage. I don't think it, it's possible to manage it. Yeah, I think it's. I mean, good on them for doing it. And it, it the art history department was excellent. And, mm-hmm. You know, and you get exposed to modernism. You you learn what it is, and um, you know it. You you do need that. You need mm. you need historical knowledge. Absolutely, it's, it's crucial. Yeah. Um, so I'm glad I'm glad I got that. But I wanted I wanted uh, more of a skill based education and uh, the, yeah I, I thought I was getting that when I enrolled. It ended up not being that. Um, so I sought that elsewhere. But but I, I'm glad I I'm glad I went through it because um, yeah I'm I'm more I'm more historically aware than I would have been had I not done it. Mm. And it's good to be, it's good to have something to come up against, you know. Mm-hmm. Sure. Um, you know, if you can, if you can handle it, because sure. it, it, you know, it can it can be too much sometimes. Absolutely. Yeah, it can it can wear you out. But, but sure. Yeah, I think I was young enough that it, I you know, went on and did something else after. So, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you're what you're talking about? 18, 19, 20? I started when I was eighteen. I finished. Yeah. yeah so I graduated. I was, I guess, twenty or twenty-one. Yes. Yeah, like. You know, you're still quite young. Yeah, and and, and I didn't. Um, I had vague ideas about what I wanted to do. I mean, yeah. you, know, you, you you're still figuring it out. Oh yeah, course, at that at age, age, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Now, how was traditional realism generally perceived by the faculty of the National Art School? Ah, well, um, not very favorably. Mm. <laughs> um, yeah, there was a there was a kind of general sense of, uh, oh, that's illustration. That's conservative. That's mm. tr- that's traditional. That's old fashioned. Uh, you know this sort of generalized um, attitude towards uh, you know learning how to draw well. Mm. Um, there's some justification of that because it, it is old fashioned, mm-hmm. but you know it can be vital as well. Absolutely. Um, and you know that's the trick, isn't it? To mm. to to make something make something alive mm. with skill. Absolutely. Um, and you know the, the the teachers that were teaching there at the time were were the inheritors of, of modernism, and so the idea of um, challenging that was 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 a key thing, and 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 making something new. But the interesting thing with modernism is is it, it's steeped in the tradition anyway. It's so close to being from that tradition. That mm. there's, there's still quite a bit of skill there. Mm-hmm. You know, like all the early European modernists were all academically trained. Yeah. You know, so they, they just they came had, to abandon it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But what happened after that was that they, if they taught at all, they didn't teach the skills. Mm. And then those students couldn't teach the skills. Mm. And then those students couldn't teach. So yeah. by the time I was learning from uh, the teachers I had, there, there was there was a disconnection um, there was a disconnection from that tradition. Even if they'd wanted to teach it, they um, they couldn't have. Although they didn't, I don't think they wanted to. They were doing other things. And look, there, there's there's a lot of nuance. I'm, I'm talking about it as if it's one or the other. But but you know, you can look at a lot of 20th, 20th century artists like like Giacometti, for example, who's um, uh, you know doing something very uh, very 20th century. Mm. You know, it, 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 you would never. Wouldn't, you wouldn't call it traditional or classical or mm. anything, but but his his drawing is phenomenal. He's an amazing drawer. Mm. Um, so there's, I, I kind of like I like that middle ground where, as long as the as long as the drawing keeps getting taught, you know, do whatever you want, but mm-hmm. but, but learn how to draw. Absolutely, you know, and, and the foundation of skill. Yeah, I think it should be always there, and and, and the twentieth century happened because it, it it was there in the academy, and so they could draw from that, and then. You know, rebel against it or use it if they wanted to, mm-hmm. but it, but it, it's it's largely gone from the, the from our culture. It's not really there in the middle. Like mm-hmm. you go to the degree awarding art schools, and it's yeah. it's not really there. That's right. There are a few pockets. You have to seek them out. Who are mm-hmm. teaching it? But it's um, so I think that's a problem. I mean, I had I had a I had a great uh, drawing teacher, uh, Michelle Hiscott, who I'm I'm actually I'm still friends with now. And she was in the drawing department, and she was really like dedicated to teaching you how to draw properly. Was she a traditionalist or more of a modern? No, she's a traditionalist. And okay. She's a landscape painter. Great. Um, she's you know still painting now and exhibiting. Um, uh, 
uh, you know, in the classical tradition of, of Claude Lorraine, you know, Poussin, uh, we would copy old master drawings, we would copy still lifes, we'd draw the skeleton, we'd draw drapery studies, all the hard stuff, Good. you know, yeah. so I was lucky, I had, I had her and I, you know, I had Wendy Sharp who was, you know, like actually a really good teacher and a good influence, I mean, um, her, her sense of colour is excellent and she's, uh, she's quite quite strongly connected to, to, to I guess the, the, the tradition of colour through someone like Delacroix mm -hmm. and, 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 and into modernism, you know, so I didn't have like really terrible uh, examples. Um, I guess I was lucky. I think it's changed now the, the, the painting department now. Mm. It's not it's not like it anymore. Um, so look, it was okay. There was there was tolerance if you wanted to do that, but but it was a kind of underlying uh, sense that you know why are you being so traditional mm. and that that kind of thing. Yeah, sure. Um, which makes you know it makes you feel a bit like you're doing something wrong. You you know makes you insecure or something. Sure. But sure. look, I, I think if you want to do something, you just do it. Absolutely. And if you have resistance, that's okay. Mm -hmm. Because it means you can um, you can articulate a response to that. Mm -hmm. So well, that's good. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it's the question of how much resistance is healthy. You know, that's right. There, there, there can be too much sometimes. Absolutely. But, but you need some. So. Yeah. So at that yeah. at that point in uh, the National Art School, your work was looking traditional. I guess, I can't, yeah, I guess, but I was also influenced by Impressionism. Okay. And I was influenced by Cezanne. Okay. You know, which is a strange, th you know, a strange combination. Um, I quite liked some some things that Cezanne got. He 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 got great um, uh, balance of balance and harmony of you know areas of color and tone. I I think some of them really work. Mm -hmm. Um, and I was painting, I'd paint seascapes, I'd go down to Coogee and take my easel and, and paint. That was my final year's work was with seascapes, I'd do plein air painting. Um, and so yeah, I was looking at Monet a lot, I was really influenced by Monet and the paint quality and the colour. Uh, but I was also looking at Turner, I was looking at Rubens, mm. looking at Rembrandt. Um, I think they're probably my biggest influences. And then when I started looking at Rubens, I was looking at technique. Sure. You know, how did he do that? Mm -hmm. Like, you can see the underpainting in the shadow. You can see the coloured ground in the mid-tone, yeah. the yellow ground. Yeah. You can see the, the mid-tone grey that he's scumbled over it in some areas, but not in others. Mm -hmm. You can see the impasto in the lights. You can see that he's glazed a laser and crimson over over vermilion to get that red. Mm -hmm. There's reflected red in the shadow. Mm -hmm. And it's very clear that it, like, the, the paint, you know, it's, it's painterly. You can see that it, he's not hiding his moves. So I became interested in that as well. And, and I, you know, I guess I got, that's when I became aware of um, what Charlie Sheard was doing. He, sure. he, was, he was running a school and um, I, met a, I met one of his current students who, who I became good friends with and I admire a lot. And he, he was kind of on my track, but further ahead, I was like, okay, I want to do what you're doing. Right. So I had, a, I had an example. Sure. Uh, yeah. Great. Yeah, yeah. Now, in 2003, you completed your BFA and set out on your own to seek teachers who had some understanding of the foundations of representational drawing and painting. Eventually, in 2004, you discovered Charlie Sheard and you would come to train one day a week at his school, the Charlie Sheard Studio School, until, to, until 2006. Can you elaborate on how you initially discovered Mr. Sheard and his school? Yeah, well, um, yeah, I was, I was just, just uh, talking about it. Um, yeah, we had an end of year show at, at National Art School. And um, actually, I think it was before that, um, this friend of mine, Tim, Tim Smith, he's now living in uh, upstate New York. We, okay. we, we ended up both going to America. He, he went before me. He's still painting? Yeah, he's still painting, yeah. Good. Yeah, he, his, his work's really good. Um, so he turned up one day because he knew one of the other students and some people you didn't you meet and you just think I got to talk to this person and it was like that with him I just felt like I got to talk to this guy mm. um, he was looking at my work and we were talking about artists and he, he mentioned talking about Titian and, and Rembrandt and I was like okay yeah this is yeah keep going <laughs> you know, this is, these are the artists that no one, no one was talking about at National Art School that I was, I was interested in and he said oh, okay well it seems like you really want to learn how to paint and then 
in, a, in a historical methods, you know. And uh, he said, yeah, you know, um, studying with this guy Charlie, he's he's an abstract painter, but he's he's uh, sort of um, knows a lot of about, about historical um, techniques, knows a lot about materials. Um, you'll you'll learn a lot about the 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 chemistry of painting, about painting in layers, mm -hmm. glazing, yeah. scumbling, um building up impasto, um, all that kind of stuff. And uh, yeah, that, that, that interested me a lot. So um, I looked up Charlie's work and um, yeah, I liked it. I mean, it, it, abstract. So the, the drawing component that I wanted wasn't there, but the, the, paint, the painting component was. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I don't know. I, I had the interview with him, and it just it, I felt it, it, it felt like like a magnet. I was drawn toward doing this. Mm -hmm. I wanted to I wanted to learn this stuff. I wanted to I wanted to look at old master paintings up close. Mm -hmm. And you know, we'd we'd he'd have a slide projector. We'd look at slides, at details, details of paintings, and we'd analyze how they're done. And, and there's a whole philosophical. Um, uh, component to that he brought to it as well, which which I still um, think about and you know uh, value. Um, but yeah, that was uh, that was fortuitous. I mean, I started with him the year after I finished art school, so I just went from one school to another straight you're straight away. Straight away, yeah, okay. yeah. It was it's not it wasn't full time. It was one day a week, but but he'd give us homework. We'd we'd go back to the studio and, and paint, try to apply the techniques that we. Um, that we talked about that week. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that's something that stayed with me. And you know, during that time, I started going to Julian Ashton Art School at night just to keep just to get my life drawing skills okay. better. All right. So it was a combination. I was trying to develop painting and drawing. Okay. Um, we did some drawing with with Charlie, but um, it was uh, I was developing different things. I was trying to learn anatomy and, and mm. you know, things more on an academic angle. Sure. Yeah. He 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 wasn't really. I wouldn't call it academic. Mm. It's um, it's something else. Yeah, I mean his it's, work. It's the painterly. It's the painterly thing. You know? Yeah, I mean, looking at his work, you'd say he's a modernist. Like you're looking at yeah. his paint yeah. application, Absolutely. abstract painting. Yeah, he's a, he's an abstract painter. Yeah, yeah, that's right. But but um, the unusual thing with him is that he he cared deeply about technique, mm. and he was really. Uh, I mean, he's he it was still in touch with him. He 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 is uh, deeply interested in in art history and and. Uh, connecting to the tradition, sure, in a different way than mm. than the atelier thing, mm. you know. But it's um, in in paint in paint painting and paint application and color, you know. You you look at you look at Venetian painting from the sixteenth century. It's um, there are connections to to painting now, you know, in in abstraction, in, mm. in the best painters. Okay. Um, so there there are there are threads that that that, that weave between between the centuries mm -hmm. and uh, so yeah I've always found it interesting um, interesting to talk to him and, and he has he had a point of view about every every art movement throughout the centuries we covered wow. we covered all of it we started from um, I don't know early renaissance probably um, and then Florentine renaissance Venetian renaissance uh, northern painting um, you know uh, the Van Eyck Mm -hmm. That kind of tradition, you know, thin glazes and things mm -hmm. like that, um, through to through to you know Rubens and the Dutch painting and Rembrandt, eighteenth century French painting, um, so, you know Velasquez and the Spanish tradition, um, through to impressionism, um, you know post impressionism, modernism, and, and the color things that happened uh, with that, uh, through to abstraction. So it was a good insight into into all of those things mm -hmm. uh, in. In terms of technique and mm -hmm. in terms of painting, not in terms of sort of uh, cultural, you know, mm -hmm. uh, cultural history mm -hmm. and or social issues or you know the way yeah. people analyze art now. So you're, you're it's always through those terms. Yeah, you're you're learning art history from a painter's perspective. Well, exactly, yeah. exactly, and yeah. um, and that was a big difference from going to National Art School. It was sort of interesting. Like we at National Art School, we we tended to look at. You look at a painting and you think, okay, well, it looks like that. Um, what's it referring to? Mm -hmm. um, what? When was it done? Uh, what? What are the references? Um, is it, is it aware of certain other art movements? Mm -hmm. You know, um, all of that was out the window when you when you're learning technique. Mm -hmm. uh, 
um, it's 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 the it's the brush mark and it's the color that you put down mm -hmm. and, and it's your choices of how you construct the painting. That's mm. actually what it is. Yeah, you know. Yeah. So um, so yeah, it was a different angle and it was an angle that I, I liked that. Sure. Yeah. Great. Yeah, it was, it was good. Sounds like it was uh, quite a comprehensive overview of art history as well. well. Yeah, yeah, it, yeah, yeah. Again, that, that's a, it's an important thing to have. Sure. Yeah. Now, I understand your focus with Mr. Sheard was on pre-20th century painting techniques. Mm -hmm. What exercises did Mr. Sheard have you complete? Okay, well, a couple come to mind. Um, so, we would look at the difference between, let's say, using a Venetian red uh, priming imprimatura. Uh, you can either use that as, as your dark, or you could use it as a mid-tone. So, I can think, I think of a couple of different artists. Um, Tintoretto, for example, would use it as a dark. Okay. So Tintoretto's main technique, and I've looked at a lot of Tintoretto, and I think this is generally true, uh, especially the big paintings that you see from a distance, mm. starts on a dark, like a Venetian red, um, sort of, it's quite a dark mid-tone, um, you know, the Venetian red tone. Mm. Uh, then when that's dry, um, do the whole painting in, in white, Okay. So the whole painting's in white, and the shadows are the, are the Venetian red. Mm. So you leave them as a reserve. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, you scumbling the scumbling the shadows. Oh, sorry, scumbling the midtones with the white, painting the painting the lights thicker with yeah. the white. So you get you get a tonal change, and you also get a temperature shift. Mm -hmm. So the mid the midtones that are scumbled appear optically cool, right? They're kind of uh, purplish gray. They have an optical like a scum, like a thin application of light over dark. Mm -hmm. You have that smoky, grey, greyish effect. And then the lights are, um, are painted more thickly and they read as optically warm. Sure. So both using white, but one is influenced by the ground or by the priming, and one is thickly painted on top and isn't really influenced by it. Um, so you've set up, you've set up optical um, temperature, warm, warm lights, cool mids, and warm darks because it's a red, the Venetian red. Mm. Okay, so you, you set up the whole painting like that. You do the whole painting in white. Mm. Uh, when that's dry, um, largely you can you can glaze over the top for local color, mm -hmm. right? Um, El Greco has a similar technique. I mean, and then they'll paint opaque over the top, and then they might do several layers. But but that's a general, um, you know, pretty standard method. Um, that, that he would use. So that's using the Venetian red priming as a, as a dark. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you can glaze the darks as well if you want to right, make the dark in right. places. Uh, Caravaggio would, would use it as a mid-tone. Mm -hmm. Okay, so he's, he's got, you know how dark his paintings are. Mm -hmm. right? um, he'll, have, he'll have the whole thing as Venetian. And, you know, this is proved by the, um, by the National Gallery in London. They, they release a technical bulletin every year. Yeah. And they've, they've done x-ray analysis of Caravaggio. They've seen that this is how it's done. Great. He, he builds up the white over the top. Okay. I, I had an argument with, um, with a, a someone I know <laughs> who was convinced that he was working on a white canvas and just making everything else dark but letting the, the light areas be white because yeah. it's luminous. Yeah, yeah. But no, he didn't do that. He, he, built, up, he built up the white over the top of the of the Venetian red mm -hmm. or whatever it is. Um, so anyway, uh, painting painting the shadows with a transparent dark, keeping the the, the mid tone like the mid tone paper that mm -hmm. I'm using, mm -hmm. keeping the Venetian red as a mid tone, and then a step up from that is is your is your optical cool for your mid tone that that'll be scumbled opaque probably color, and then a building up more thick paint into the lights. So you. So the same tone that's in the Tintoretto as a dark is a mid-tone in Caravaggio, so the darks have to go even darker. So the overall, yeah. the overall effect is that, is that it's, it's a broader range of tone and it's a, it's a darker painting. Mm. You can see the same thing with uh, uh, Giuseppe Ribera mm. and lots of 17th century Italian painting. Yeah. You know, that, that's the standard. You, you go to look at them and you'll see that they're using that, that mid-tone. Mm. They're using that um, Venetian red as, as a mid-tone. Sure. It's very common. And, and you get a result quickly. Sure. So anyway, that's a couple of... We, we would do those exercises. We'd mm. do a painting using it as a dark. We'd do a painting using it as a mid. Um, we would, uh, you know... Um, attempt to replicate some of Rembrandt's effects, which mm -hmm. he had so many effects that, right. you know, like, 
we didn't try to do all of that. But you know, one of it, it's it's not dissimilar from what I just described Caravaggio doing, except probably not on a red, more on a, on a dark brown. But then building up a lot of impasto in the early stages mm -hmm. of the painting um, to, to to build up the texture, um, and working glazing and opaque wet into wet. Sure. To to get to get that to, those sort of transitional effects. Yeah. Um, I mean that that's a topic that you could really spend you know odd nerdrums school that's, mm. what, that's what they're trying to do yeah right, you know, right. they're trying to really interrogate rembrandt's technique mm. at least odd nerdrum is i think his students to a degree uh, you know some are going further than others but but yeah his, that's that's that that's what they're sort of doing over there sure um so yeah lots of different methods and we we um exploring different mediums as well oh yeah 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 um and getting to know okay getting to know the, the pigments that's a big part of it mm. um Use, if you're using good quality paint, um, paint's not all the same substance. Like mm. uh, like a yellow ochre will be gritty. Yeah, feels like s dirt mm. or sand. Um, lead white is thick. It's it's very stiff. Mm -hmm. um, ultramarine blue is kind of stringy. Mm. Um, Indian yellow is like this slippery thing. Um, um, the uh, Venetian red is, is quite stiff, but but not as stiff as lead white. I'm not talking about the colours. I'm talking about the, the texture. The texture of the paint. Of the paint yeah. Right. And if you, I mean, we, we we would grind our own paint a little bit just as uh, to to do it, just mm. so to know what it's like. But we're, mostly we were just using really good quality um, tube paint, like Old Holland. Yeah, sure. Know, and in good quality paint, those textural differences are more pronounced. Yeah. And they don't add any fillers. Sure. Um, and so that that became part of um, thinking about painting was that the textural differences inherent in in each pigment, mm -hmm. right? So you've got obviously um, some colours that have a higher chroma, some colours that have a higher tinting strength, some are more transparent, some are more opaque, mm -hmm. and the different textures. And so a lot of what we did was to try to be sensitive to um, to, to those differences yeah. and let let that kind of influence how you paint like sure. let, let that kind of uh, guide you in a way mm -hmm. um, it's just being aware of other qualities rather than thinking oh it's just it's just a color and because um, a lot of a lot of paint brands will just make it all consistent mm. you know, consistent texture mm -hmm. uh, which is easier to use if you're learning to paint but um, yeah what I mean uh, artists traditionally did grind their own paints and mm. the, you know when you look at when you look at these uh, paint films under a microscope the lead white particles are like that big wow. and the uh, well under a microscope mm. and the uh, you know the ivory black pigments Tiny. are like yeah, yeah. The, you know it's uh, it, one's one's sort of um, crushed up burnt bone and one's um, lead, lead carbonate so mm. they're physically different substances mm -hmm. and so I think um, one of the things Charlie really often talked about was that these these artists were um, the the textures were even more pronounced than than in yeah. than in an old Holland or something. So the sensitive painters would be, would be really attuned to that, mm. and that's part of what what gives them their paintings that that magic. You know? Sure, but there's many factors, right, that, that give that. Great. The magic. So, yeah. So like there a, was there was a lot. There was a lot there. Sounds like you had like a really in depth uh, training to the the actual physicality of paint, uh, understanding yeah. for chemical properties. Yeah. And how to go about different bases and such. Yeah, and you know archival things as well. Mm -hmm. um, we we would cover. Um, there's a, there's a lot of information there. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it was good. So like I've still got my notes. So. Great. <laughs> yeah. Fantastic. <laughs> Now, during your time with Mr. Sheed, you began attending the Julian Ashton Art School right. beginning in 2004 and concluding in 2007. How did you learn of this particular school? Oh, everyone knew about Julian Ashton's. I mean, it was just there, it's been there forever. It's mm. in the rocks. Um, yeah, well, I have a friend uh, called Dominic who I, we both were at National Art School at the same time. And he was even more interested in... Um, and learning to draw like the old masters than I was and so he ended up leaving National Art School I think after the first year and going to Julian Ashton okay and right. he, he stayed there and he got a scholarship and he he ended up um, like becoming really good good really good at drawing 
um, from being there. And so I was kind of aware of it from him and I would, um, so yeah, I would, I would start, I would, I would go at night and, um, and on Saturdays. Yeah. Um, but I was kind of doing, doing my own thing um, when I was there. I wasn't really, wasn't really enrolled much for much of it. I was just kind of there drawing the casts in my own way and um, paying, you pay the $12 for the sketch club just to be there, you know. Yeah, sure. Uh, but, but I would glean, I would glean information from, you know, people like David Briggs and, mm. and the other teachers that were there. And then, um, yeah, you, you do that enough and you, you pick up a few things. Sure. Yeah, it was a little bit, um, yeah, I, 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 was, I wanted to be there, but I didn't want to completely be there. It was a funny thing. That mm. I definitely got a lot out of it. And then, and then later on, I ended up enrolling to do cast drawing there. I Absolutely. just said, all right, I'll just, I'll just commit to this. Sure. You know, so, mm. yeah. Now, can you explain your course of training at the Julian Ashton Art School, including who your teachers were at the time? So okay. this, is, this is explaining uh, at the point that you had actually enrolled in the yeah, program. Okay. Yeah. Well, uh, Richard Porter was teaching me cast drawing. Okay. Uh, he, I think he's still there. Mm -hmm. um, yep, yeah, I was teaching on Tuesdays at that time. Mm. He might still be. Okay. Um, and yeah, just um, he would get us to draw the cast, um, the actual size of the cast. Okay. But like the cast is there, and mm -hmm. you're you're here, mm -hmm. so you've got to somehow know how big it is. Wow. Okay. <laughs> Which is really hard. So that's an interesting kind of measurement. Yeah. yeah. Um, I've heard of that from other. I think I think I've even heard of that from uh, the Russian mm. people doing that. Maybe I've heard it somewhere. Anyway, it's sort of interesting because it. Um, it, it gets you to judge distances pretty well because okay. even and he'd get you to you take your drawing over put it next to the cast and then stand back it kind of like the sight size yeah and then see if it is but then you take your drawing back and make the adjustments and so uh, that was that was good um although he wouldn't spend a lot of time on the cast you'd sort of do one in a day okay you would uh develop it two-dimensionally then you start thinking about construction and then light and shade and then, you know, it'd be time to go home and, yeah, you come back next time and do another one. Okay. Um, and so that my, my casts ended up looking quite geometric because I, I didn't, like, refine all of the contours and things like that, mm. uh, just with the time limit. Uh, but, but I did learn a lot from that. Um, you start to think um, three-dimensionally about the skull and, uh, and about any volume that you see. Um, yeah, I, I mentioned David Briggs. I mean, I wasn't actually enrolled in his class but I attended so many of his um his classes as a as a kind of sketch club guy okay. that I, I learned a lot and he was teaching the he was teaching elements of the Kim on Nicolaides book mm. in combination with um Bridgman yeah Bridgman yeah. the the anatomy stuff mm. was out of Bridgman and Nicolaides does mention look at Bridgman mm. but he doesn't really elaborate on that they they've made it into a he made it into a course of study. Sure. And he would also emphasize, you know, like plumb lines, angles, mm -hmm. distances between points, uh, all that 2D stuff that I was talking about before. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, he really kind of brought all those things together, which, which is pretty cool. You sure. Know, not, not many people uh, end up doing that. Mm. Um, Murray Bird was there on Saturdays, uh, and I, I would always be there on Saturday because it was a 10-week pose. Oh, correct. And... Yeah. Um, Again, I was just there for the sketch club, but uh, I did learn a lot from Murray, just um, talking to him and, and listening as he's uh, critiquing other students. Um, who else was there? I mean, other students I would learn from. Uh, Ryan Daffern, he's, a, he's in Brisbane now. Okay. Great, great, great drawer and painter. Like, probably one of the best in the country. Wow. It's brilliant. Yeah. Um, my other friend Dominic, who I mentioned before, Dominic Miller, he's... he's uh, in Sydney, um, working, teaching and, and um, drawing and making paintings, also excellent. Mm. Um, was it Samuel Wade or Chris Brown there? Chris Brown wasn't there. Sam was, had just finished. Okay. Um, he was sort of around, I think he was starting to exhibit uh, at that, that time. That time. Yeah. Kind of as I left, as I left Sydney, he was, he was having his exhibitions. And I was pretty interested in that because he was making these paintings that were, uh, you know, um, multiple figures, uh, landscape, architecture, you know, atmosphere, mm. narrative, 
Sure. You know, I thought, wow, okay, that's, that's stepping it up mm -hmm. to another level. So I was impressed with that. Um, Chris, I didn't know Chris um, then. I became aware of his work, I guess, when he started exhibiting, went to his first show. Okay. With Francis Keeble, and it was quite, quite incredible. Mm. Um, Frank Giacco was there okay. at that time. Um, I only got to know Frank a bit later, actually, but um, I got to see him around. Um, Jessica Ashton. Mm -hmm. These are these are students who mm -hmm. were there at the time I was there. Um, yeah, she she's she's doing great work now. Sure. Yeah, you see her in the in the art prizes and stuff as mm -hmm. well. Yeah, that's um, yeah, that's kind of the crowd. There's probably more probably that I can. Oh, uh, Ben Ben Smith. Okay. He, yeah, he he was a student at that time. Sure. Yeah. Um, it was a good good crowd, and, yeah. and a lot of those people have have continued. You know, they're, they're still painting and, and making good work. Sure. Because you know, art schools, it's um, doesn't always happen like that. Yeah. That's... Ashton's has a good rate though of, yeah. of, of actual people who continue. Well, I, I'm a lot of the prominent uh, Australian realists have at some point or another passed through. Yeah, school. it seems to be that like one of the few places you can go to to learn this stuff. It's, yeah. It's just a common trope, you know. Um, people would be doing their degree at NAS, mm. and in their spare time they'd be going to Ashton's to to practice yeah. drawing because. Sure. Um, they they probably weren't getting that kind of that kind of drawing um, mm. uh, teaching at national sure. art school. So yeah. Did you have much contact with Paul Dalprat when you were at Julian Ashton? Not much. I kind of got to know him afterwards. Um, yeah, he's a, he's a real character. Mm. I mean, have, have you met him? I haven't met him, yeah. but I've, I've heard yeah, he's yeah. quite a character. He's a character. Yeah, mm. he's a great guy, larger than life. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, I, he'd he'd come in every now and then. He had a great. He had a great uh, little story he told once. You'd probably like this. Because, um, you know, Julian Ashton is across the road from the Museum of Contemporary yeah. Art. Yeah. Okay, so there were, door, there were some doors um, of the Museum of Contemporary Art. I must have said um, uh, Museum of Contemporary Art like that. Okay, right. Then when they opened, you could see the writing on either side. And there, there was a press conference. Okay. And, you know, people were taking photos and stuff. Someone was giving a speech about the exhibition. On the doors, one door it said Museum of Con, and the other door it said Temporary Art. <laughs> so he used to. I remember he told that story once. And mm. I thought, wow, that's that's quite funny. That's interesting, isn't <laughs> yeah, it? Yeah. <laughs> that's interesting. There's a lot of uh, a lot of stories you get from old time traditionalist painters uh, about you know the modernist the modernist uh, schools. They have his, uh, his, his jokes and, and things. Sure. It seems like it was a bit of a pastime for him to sit around. Sure, like, look. In between model breaks or something, just talking yeah, about Yeah, you know, it's, it's, a bit, it's a bit tribal and, and you want to, you know, you, you disparage the thing that you don't like. It's, yeah. It's, I'm sure they're doing, the modern guys are doing that doing the same. The, to the traditionalists. Yeah, absolutely. Well. It's, it's normal. Fantastic. <laughs> so... At this point, you're training at Julian National School. You're uh, attending the Charlie Sheard Studio yeah, School one both. day a week. Yeah, that's right. Did you find that training at two different art schools was beneficial or was some of the information your teachers were giving you contradicting what others would explain? Uh, well, if I was enrolled more at Julian National, it probably would have been contradictory, but I wasn't really enrolled the whole time. I was just kind of there to draw. Mm -hmm. So I was, um, I was learning what I could about drawing there. But I wasn't really imbibing any of the the stuff they were talking about with painting. Right. Um, that I was I was you know studying with Charlie uh, at that time. Um, you know that was informing my painting knowledge. So um, no, I don't think it. I don't think it was contradictory. I think it was helpful. You can never do too much drawing. Drawing will help you in in everything Absolutely. you do. So. So it made my painting better. Mm -hmm. I think no, I think it was a good balance. Um, doing both of those things. Sure. And just to be just to be giving time to drawing and painting every day, just giving as much time as you can. Like you've got to look intensely at it. Absolutely. So wherever if there's if there's a chance to draw the model you'll you'll take it, you know. Yeah. But being in that environment with good lighting and people around you who are, who know anatomy and who are in t intending to you know, make a figure that looks, you know, convincing, mm. that, that helps. Absolutely. Yeah, you know. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. As you mentioned previously you completed your training at the Julian Art School in 2007. During the same year, you met your wife, Sweta, on a meditation retreat 
and you moved to Dubai with her and eventually got married. Yep. In Dubai, you worked as a high school art teacher for a year and a half whilst developing your drawings and paintings in the evenings. Can you elaborate on your time in Dubai and specifically your time working as an art teacher? Yeah, well, yeah, I, I didn't intend on taking a job. I just wanted to be an artist, you know, mm -hmm. it's just paint full time, draw full sure. time, this and that. Um, this school, uh, my wife is a, she had her own boutique. Um, she's a fashion designer and um, she ended up getting a lot of uh, work from this school, making costumes and uniforms and all that stuff. And so I, we got to know them. Mm. And the headmaster just said, look, you're an artist. Do you want to be the art teacher? We need an art teacher. And I was like, mm. yeah, okay, I'll give it a try. So um, he said, oh, yeah, by the way, you're also going to be the media studies teacher. So I ended <laughs> up teaching media studies too, Okay. Um, which, was, which was actually kind of fun. Um, look, it was a good... It was good for a while. Um, yeah, look, it's always great to impart knowledge to students, and I, I would always bend the, the curriculum toward like you know drawing well and mm. understanding color and teaching them the things that I was mm. that I knew. Um, teaching media studies was uh, you know different, but it was about it was about analyzing um, analyzing texts, you know, visual texts or whatever written texts, trying to you know break them down. Um, yeah, when you're doing it at a high school level, I think that's kind of fun mm. breaking down media. I think I think that kind of that kind of analysis can can be uh, can can serve to undermine undermine culture when it's taken yeah. too far. But at the level we were doing it, it was it was kind of insightful to see how how things are put together. Sure. So I was doing both of those things. Um, look, it was fine, and the schedule was good. Like it was a really early day. I think we'd start the class would start at eight o'clock. Oh wow! It's yeah, and then, start. yeah, and then uh, we would finish it. I think t quarter to two or something. Okay. So you're home by two thirty mm -hmm. or three, then you got like the whole afternoon and evening and night. Mm. So yeah, so I, I would I would be drawing casts and painting still lifes and you know doing portraits of my wife and just doing as much drawing and painting as I could. So I did get a lot. I did get a lot of drawing and painting done mm -hmm. uh, while I was teaching. Um, and you know, in, in free periods, I'd be drawing. You know, I, I wasn't cut out to do the high school teaching. I I I, I was good at it, but I don't, I I I couldn't deal with the um, all the all the parking and the bureaucracy. Of, you know, mm. you know, you know what it's like. Mm. The extra work, which isn't the teaching bit. Yeah. Um, that got a bit much for me. Uh, plus, you know, um, she had a visa, Australian visa. Um, application due so we had to come back to Australia anyway mm. but during that time um, I was researching online I thought I want to go to New York Grand Central Academy okay my, my friend Tim who I mentioned before who studied with Charlie he, he'd found out about Grand Central Academy he went over there for a while and he said oh there's a school in New York like it's really good cast drawing cast painting it, it's such a high standard the teachers work is amazing I had a look at uh, Jacob's work and some other people. I was like, "Wow, okay, this is, this is, this is this kind of stuff that I, I, I wish I was doing, you know." And these guys are actually doing it, and it was kind of a dream to go there. Um, we during the summer break, we went over there for two months to New York, and I thought I'll do I'll do some workshops. Mm. Um, and I I did the workshops, but by the end of the first day, I realised. Um, Kind of the the habits that I developed, um, some of them were good, some of them weren't helping me see and draw better. Mm. And I decided I wanted to um, actually just give time to to dedicate dedicate myself to the the method that they taught to get the results that I was seeing from that school. Mm. You know, okay. And it, it is it's a form of submission, really. You know, yeah. and I and I and and I was a bit older, and I'd been painting for a few years. Yeah, I'd been to like two art schools, mm. plus Julian Ashton, and then I'm thinking I'm going to go back to art school. I guess, mm. you know. So it was, a, it was kind of a weird feeling, but but I, I just knew that my work would improve. Yeah, and I was seeing the results from the the students who were further ahead than me and the teachers, and I thought, okay, well, this is the training they went through. So uh, I just decided. So. Um, Kind of decided to, that um, to 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 enrol in the full time program. 
Sure. Yeah. Okay, that's yeah. interesting. Yeah. So, so just to backtrack for a moment there. Yeah. Uh, so, prior to going to GCA and to New York, you you met you met your wife Swetha on a meditation retreat. Yes. So, is meditation something that you're into? Oh yeah, yeah. Um, since I was seventeen, really. Wow, yeah, that's yeah. quite young. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I had a kind of profound experience when I was seventeen, um, and. Um, I grew up in a family that, that meditates, like my parents meditate. Okay. Um, but I, I knew, I kind of knew it was um, good, uh, but, but I, had, I had a sort of profound experience that really sort of showed me what, what the real benefits of it are, and since then I've been, been meditating. And, um, yeah, my wife was living, she's from India, but she was living in Dubai, and she came, came to Australia for this, this event. Mm. And... Um, yeah, you know, we we met, we kind of, you know, we like each other, we stay in touch. Um, yeah, that you know, I went I lived in Dubai for a while, her family was there at the time, I met her family. Um, yeah, we ended up getting married. No, it's 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 an important thing. It's um it gives you clarity, you know. Yeah. It, it, you it, you can step step into yourself, let you know, let go. Mm. Um, try to just, you know, create some space. Mm -hmm. um, try to connect to the source. Sure. You know, um, your spirit mm. um, mm. and nature. So, um, mm. yeah, no, it, it's, uh, yeah, I, I see it as a, it's a it's like a, like a touchstone to, to reality, yeah. you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting as well, because considering how much time and patience, the kind of work that uh, we do require. Yeah. Do you think your meditation helps your painting? Yeah, Enjoy? yeah, I think so. I mean, there are definitely similarities. I mean, there. Are, I think you know, doing this kind of drawing is is a type of meditation. I think it puts you in a similar kind of state. Absolutely. It, it, it refines your attention. Mm -hmm. Like your attention becomes really good. Mm -hmm. um, it's not exactly the same because you're you're still um, trying to achieve something, right? You know, rather than letting go. Sure. But but yeah, it's um. I think they help each other. I mean, uh, certainly. I mean, but you know, there'll be people who um, who who do this kind of work and, and don't meditate, but their work is 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 that for them. I yeah. Guess, you know. So. Um, yeah, I think in in other ways as well. It um it's given me. Um, yeah, I don't know sen sensitivity to nature. I don't mm. know, but I don't know. It, it's so much part of me that that I don't. That, that it's hard to say where that comes from, but, but I think certainly it, it does help. Sure. It opens you up to that. Great, yeah. great. Yeah. Now, in 2009, you and Switzer moved to New York for eight weeks to partake in summer workshops at the Grand Central Atelier, that's right. which was then the Grand Central Academy. Yeah, that's right. How did you initially discover GCA? So you mentioned that it was your friend Tim who let you know about yeah, the school. Yeah, then the website, then the, website. Then the blog. I, was, I read their blog every day, wait for them to put a new thing on the blog, see the student work. Still see, today? See, do you do uh, that? Well, they're not really using it. They do Instagram now. Well, yeah. yeah. So but yeah, yeah, back then, it was there was no Instagram. It was all the blog. The blog, yeah. So yeah, I was following blogs, Gurney Journey, and, and that blog, yeah. and a couple of mm -hmm. others. I was like, my, 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 oh, yeah. my link to that world. It's incredible how much you learn just from following those blogs. Totally, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's, yeah, so true. Um, yeah, so I was just following the work and I was looking at the student work and think, how the hell do they do that? How do they get that light effect? How do they get it to glow like that? Um, trying to, trying to reproduce that in my own work, mm -hmm. trying to understand, like reading what I could. Mm -hmm. Re I read, you know, some, you read all kinds of contradictory stuff, you know, like I read Sargent said, you know, use the biggest brush possible. I was like, okay, well, Sargent, you know, use the big brushes to do casts. <laughs> didn't give me the right effect. Yeah. I found out later they used tiny brushes. <laughs> Jeez, yeah. yeah. So, he's trying to figure it out. <laughs> I had a, had a, yeah. But, um, so yeah, basically online, following the blog, um, then, yeah, contacted them and, yeah, we went over there for eight weeks and then, yeah, ended up just deciding I'm going to go back there. Sure. Do it full time. Fantastic. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Now, can you describe what your initial impressions of GCA was during your very first day that you walked into the school and discovered the training that took place there? Uh, yeah, it was, it was great. Um, woke up feeling really excited. It was summer in New York, so everyone's in a good mood. The weather's nice. Um, yeah, I did Josh LaRocque's class first, just cast drawing. 
like a like a basic class. Um, but yeah, I met met a lot of the other students. I met Greg Mortensen there. Danny Grant was there. Met him, and you know, um, Colleen Barry was there. Met her on the first day, I think, in Will Will St John. That you know, they're married now. I uh, met Josh. Um, Josh had some of his paintings there, which I'd seen online and mm. seen them in the flesh was was uh, pretty cool. Um, yeah, there's there's just plenty of examples of great drawings around. Yeah. Um, there's the cast hall was was great, really big, uh, you know, life size um, casts from from uh, ancient Roman sculpture and, and a whole lot of other stuff. Um, just the just the focus and and the sense of uh, knowing this is a method that works. Yeah, right. And I was like, I had missing pieces of how to do that. Sure. And so when uh, he he laid out like the process of how to do the block in, I was like, ah, oh, if someone had only told me that, like, yeah, like five years ago, sure, I, I, I would have been doing it the whole time. Mm. So you know, it's um, finding the right teacher with the right information is is really helpful. But yeah, it was um. Yeah, I was just impressed with the, the standard, you know. Sure. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Now, during your first class at GCA, you realized that you needed to com complete the full-time core program. Yeah. What made you come to this decision? Uh, I think it was, yeah, as I mentioned, like, just the, um, like, the, the habits you develop may, yeah. not, may not help you to get the result you want. Mm -hmm. And so... Um, I was following the, the, the method that um, you know Josh was laying out. I'm like, oh yeah, cool. I get this. I got to do this like many, 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 many times over. Mm -hmm. I got to do this for you know ten thousand hours. Yeah. Then I'll get good at it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so, um, and just yeah, it just again, just like just like a magnet, you just feel like you've got to do it. Mm -hmm. I just felt like I had to do it. It was what I was looking for. Sure. You know, simple as that. Okay. So, yeah. Sure. Yeah. Now, in early 2010, you moved back to Sydney for 10 months to save money for your move to New York. This saw you working in a call center by day yep. and in a restaurant at night while Schweitzer worked in a cafe. That's right. This sounds like it would have been a mundane year. Yeah, that was a pretty boring year. Yeah. 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 Yeah, there was there was light at the end of the tunnel, and that was to go to New York. Yeah. That kept you going. Yeah, it was, it was pretty boring otherwise. Because yeah, I was I was working eight hours at the call center, and then I'd get the train to. I was working in Strathfield. I'd get the train to uh, Kings Cross. Wow. Go work at the pizza shop at night, uh, and you know that was seven nights a week. The call center was only five days a week. I had the weekends days free, but. Yeah, just to save the money. Yeah, and she's she was working at a at a cafe. Yeah, yeah, it wasn't wasn't really fun. Um, mm. um you know, but yeah, you do what you got to do. Not much time for drawing and painting. The, during just those just, eight just on the weekend, really. Just a little bit. And weekend. when I was working at the call center, I'd try and draw. No one was looking. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but, um, Good. Yeah, no, it was. Uh, yeah, not 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 much. But but I knew when, once I once I got there, that's all I would have to do. So. Mm. That's yeah, right. Yeah. So, so you were able to put away a bit of money during that time. Yeah, yeah. We saved. We, you know, we were living. We were living simply in America, uh, sharing a house with some friends and everything. But, um, yeah, we we had savings. Savings, you know, lasted us for the first year. But I think we went back to it, back to Cam's after that and during that summer. And we both worked at coffee club for um, oh, okay. three months. Yeah, two different coffee clubs. They wouldn't put <laughs> us in the same one. Oh, wouldn't they? Okay. <laughs> Um, so yeah, we, we, um, went back to Australia Works and then went back again. So, you know, we, and then so you and came then, back, you didn't stay for three years full time, you'd come back. Yeah. Well, the school closes for the summer because yeah. they have three months off every year. Okay. So I did the year, then came back for three months and went back again for the second year. And then in that summer we stayed there oh, you know, and right. then just stuck it through. Sure. And then we, you know, we, we made a bit of money. Like I'd sold, sold a few paintings at the end, uh, another thing that we made we, we'd sell shredded was doing some babysitting and do a bit of art teaching just you know we, we got by okay yeah were you yeah. teaching at GCA no uh, towards the end I was mm -hmm. yeah if I'd stayed longer I would have probably continued but um mm. but no, I was just teaching some kids on the weekend oh just some neighbor, okay. neighbors kids oh lovely yeah, yeah. nice yeah. great great yeah. now you ended up returning to GCA in late 2010 to begin the full-time program that's right 
Can you give some insight into the process of preparing your folio for the GCA interview, including the works you had to include and how you felt about your chances of getting accepted? Yeah, well, that was funny actually. Um, I'd spoken to Colleen Barry about getting in and um, she said, yeah, look, Jacob's going to try and talk you out of it. Um, so, you know, just be aware of that. Um, tell, you know, he'll, he'll tell you reasons why you, you, you shouldn't do it. Uh, just, you know, if you really want to do it, just stick to it and, you know, try to convince him. Tell him you want to be part of the community, you want to contribute and all this stuff. Uh, and that's pretty much what happened. Uh, like, Jacob called me. Uh, he said, oh, so you're from Australia? Yeah, yeah. Ah, oh, it's going to be really hard. The visa situation is mm. like, you won't be able to do it. We can't offer you a visa. I'm really sorry, you, you can't do this. Um, you know, your work's already good anyway, so you don't need it. Like, you're fine, just just do do what you're doing. Um, you know, it, it's you don't need to, you know, yeah, you, you're fine. Mm. I, I just said, well, no, I re actually really want to do this, it feels like. It's the, you know, the kind of training that, I, that I've been looking for for a long time. Um, then I think he said something else. Oh, you, you know, you're 28, you know, by the time you finish, you're going to be 31, it's, you know, you're going to be older than the other students. And, you know, these are things I thought about. And I was like, well, yeah, that may be true, but I, I just want to do it anyway. Mm. And he kept, he, you know, he kept, he kept giving me reasons to not do it, to say no. Uh, but I was, I don't know, it's just a strong feeling that, that I really wanted to do this. I actually became really emotional about it. And that's wow. sort of a, said, I don't care, I'm going to do this. And, um, mm. And then he said, all right, send me, send me your work, show me what it looks like. Um, so you were in Australia? No, I was in New York. Okay. Uh, he was in, um, he was, he's got a house in Connecticut, he was up there. So okay. I, didn't, I didn't actually meet him at the time, just talked on the phone. Uh, then he said, all right, well, um, you're doing these workshops, send me your work in, in, in two weeks, show me what you've done. And um, I did that and he said, yeah, sure, you can do it. Oh, wow. So... Uh, he wanted to check if you're really serious. He doesn't want people that aren't really serious. Because, mm. you know, otherwise someone else could have had that spot. That's and true. And the teachers are putting in their time to teach you, so... Right. Um, and Colin had warned me that he would do that, so I kind of knew. <laughs> you're prepared. <laughs> I was prepared, yeah. 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 Sure. Now, are you able to recall the interview process, including who interviewed you, and what some of the questions that were asked to you were. Now, was that was that the interview? Just that was then? A, that was the interview. Okay, yeah, that, was that, interview. Was, that was a phone interview. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, normally it's in person. Yeah. Um, and and often it's with sort of three teachers. Oh um, yeah. I just got the one on one on the phone. It's probably easier actually. Um. Yeah. Look, I don't know. I mean, anyone who wants to really do this is 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 just going to be passionate about wanting to do it, and yeah. no one can stop you. And that's what he wanted to hear, mm. which is the truth, you know. Sure. So, um, but yeah, the I guess the questions were, you know, are you willing to give that much time to just draw? Mm. Like, because you're already painting, do you want to just draw and draw and draw and draw and draw for like, like two years, mm. just draw, just drawing? Yeah, and I was like. Yeah. Wow. Like, if you have to do it, you do it. You know? mm. So, um... Fantastic. Yeah, it's, it's, tra it's training, right? Yeah, you know. Right. And at times, I, I sort of wished I'd done this training earlier. Earlier, yeah. You know, but whatever. It wasn't available, so... Yeah. Not in Australia, anyway. Sure, Yeah. sure. Do you remember the day that you found out that you had been accepted? Um, not that well. I mean, I guess he just sort of said, yeah... Yeah, all right. It wasn't a big event. Okay, so it was just more of an informal. And I think it was on the phone yeah. as well. But I was, I was, I guess I was really happy. Mm -hmm. I, I get, yeah, I, I'm, I'm sure I was. Sure. I, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Great. Great. Yeah. Was it a big decision for you to make to move to New York for three years? Uh, yeah, it was a big change for but for us. I mean, we didn't have kids at that time. It's just the two of us, so that was good. Um. Yeah, like, I don't know, our life was so different back then, we didn't own any furniture, we didn't own any cutlery or frying pans, <laughs> we didn't have a lot of stuff, you mm, know, mm. so we moved there and we, we were sharing with friends and, um, the, you know, everything was in the house already, so we, you know, it's come sometimes easier when you don't have much, I mean, if, you, if, you, if you're sharing. Yeah. Um, I don't know, we were, we were quite adventurous, I guess. Mm. 
That's the way I remember it anyway. Sure. My wife might not, she might see it differently if you ask her. <laughs> so what was uh, the, the place you're staying with friends close to GCA? Or was uh, it, away it was away? close. It was on the New Jersey side oh, of, of, of the border, but, but it was about half an hour on the bus oh, from, okay. from where we were living to to um, Port Authority, which is on 42nd Street, and then just, it was just two blocks okay. to, to GCA, so. Yeah. Yeah, it was really good, actually. It was sort of in, in the suburbs, right. quiet, you know, we weren't living in the city. Sure. Yeah. So, so yeah. what were your hours like at GCA? Would you start really early and finish late at night? Yeah, so that, that school uh, it starts at 8.30, mm-hmm. and that means the model is standing on the, po- on the podium at 8.30. Wow. With okay. the time is on. Yeah. So you've got to be ready before that. Mm. Uh, that goes till 12.30. Um, you have a half an hour lunch break, and then the new model comes at 1. Okay. And they go till 5. Okay. And then for most people, they go home. For some people, they'll stay. There's night classes. Uh, they go for three hours. Mm-hmm. And I, I, I didn't do night classes at first, but towards the end of it, I would also do the night classes. So, yeah, it's like, it's like eight hours, sometimes 12 hours. Wow. So towards the end, because because I knew I was going back to Australia, I just like did did the night classes too. Mm. Um, so you'd finish up at about ten o'clock at uh, night. Yeah, nine thirty or ten. Nine thirty at ten yeah, o'clock. Wow. Yeah, yeah. It's a big day. Probably nine thirty. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it is. Um, yeah. Sure. Yeah, but you know, like it's it's a it's a time of your life that if if you get the opportunity to do it. Um, that you, your life is simple enough that you don't have a whole lot of other stuff going mm. on. You know, you've got to set it up like that. I mean, we we were getting by um, financially, like, you know, I didn't have to have another job. I didn't have a visa for it anyway. We'd had our savings and, you know, yeah. If you don't have other stuff going on, my life's so different now. i got two kids, so mm. you can't have that schedule. Sure. But it's nice to have that schedule sometimes, mm. to, just to have that intensity. But but yeah, I was lucky to have it for for quite a while. Great, so, yeah, yeah, fantastic. Yeah. Now, can you provide an overview of your time in GCA, including the sequencing of the training, the rate of your development, the discoveries you made, and who were some of the teachers you had whilst there? Okay, um, Josh Larock, in terms of teachers, uh, Scott Waddell. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, Edward Minow, mm-hmm. uh, Jacob Collins, uh, Mason Sullivan, Chris Waddell, um, Angela Cunningham. Yeah, she was there. She was kind of a senior student. Oh, was she at that time? She wasn't really teaching. Mm-hmm. She might have been a little bit. Um, Tony Cyrano. Yeah, Tony Cyrano was yeah teaching still life. Um, yeah, that's, that's the crew basically. Col- and then, and Colleen and Will were there, but they weren't really, they weren't teaching, they were senior students. Okay. So yeah, there was, um, they're teaching now and Greg, yeah. Greg, Greg was there, but he's, he's teaching now, but he was still a student. Justin Wood as well. Mm, yeah, um, sure. Um, yeah, so the, the, the way they, they run it, um, you spend you spend time copying the bard plates, and then you you do cast drawing. So you'll you'll uh, probably do cut you'll do cast drawing in the morning, and and that's like an extended cast drawing. You do a feature cast, and you might spend a couple of weeks on it or something that's fully modelled, mm. um, or maybe a month, depending on how complicated it is or how long it takes. Then you do an intermediate cast. Like I did a skull. So, you know, there's a whole lot of uh, other casts you can choose from. And then, you know, you do an advanced cast, like a complicated one that you'll spend probably months on. Mm. It's changed a bit now. They're trying to make people do the cast a bit quicker. But when I was there, it was, um, yeah, Devin Cecil Wishing was there. He was mm. do- he was doing this insane drawing of uh, St. Jerome, which was just like ridiculously mm. good. It's, a, it's a amazing. You've probably seen that. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, he spent a long time and, and everyone kind of, he was setting the pace for everyone. <laughs> he was so, was, he was just really taking a long time to do that drawing mm. and that's why it's so good but everyone was kind of like well we should probably take a long time too i mean i felt that anyway it's funny how you get influenced by whatever's going on yeah you know, that's sort of character of the school at the time but you know sometimes it takes a long time to learn how to do something i mean it did for me so anyway cast drawing in the morning and then afternoons you're copying the bag plates mm. and then you 
you're drawing casts from different angles, uh, just in f like a four hour drawing. Yeah. Um, uh, then you do the bug figures, drawing them. Uh, then eventually you move into the figure room. You're still doing cast drawing in the morning, but you do figure in the afternoon. Mm -hmm. Usually that's just block ends. Uh, and then you might end up doing the month long poses yeah. in drawing. That's that's, that's what? An eighty hour huh? Eighty hours, yeah. yeah. So it's it's five days a week for a month. So it's, wow. it ends up eighty hours altogether. Great. Um, and then you're doing cast painting in the mornings mm -hmm. or afternoons. I think I ended up doing it in the afternoon and figure in the morning because I wanted to be in Jacob's class. Um, and then after you've done all your cast paintings. Uh, you do sort of three or four of them, then you go into the figure room and you're either drawing the figure, um, modeling modeling the whole drawing with graphite, and once you've done a few of them, you do paint the figure in grisaille. So okay. we'd, we'd mix up tones of um, black and white or um, like neutral neutral tones. Mm -hmm. We tubed all of those, like we'd do the Munsell scale of one to ten. Mm -hmm. um, Tony sort of um, facilitated that. Uh, and then, yeah, you're painting the figure in Grisaille, you do maybe, um, I don't know, six or seven of them, and then you paint the figure in colour, and that's kind of where you want to be, okay. painting the figure in colour, because that's, you know, yeah, that's the that's end of, a that's, culmination. That's, yeah, all, all of your skills have, have been leading up to yeah. that. And um, so, yeah, I, you know, most of, pretty much the whole um, third year I was doing that, just in the figure room the whole time, painting the figure in colour. Sure. Um, yeah, so that's pretty much how it runs. And then sculpture is part of that as well. You're meant to take some time. Everyone takes time out to do some sculpture. Mm -hmm. uh, and still life. Yeah. Tony was teaching still life. I didn't really make time for still life because, yeah. you know, I was from another country. I wanted to just paint the figure. Absolutely. I, and I ended up doing lots of still lifes anyway. Sure. So, yeah. Great, great. So that's pretty much, uh, you know, it's changed a bit now, but at the, at the time, that's how it was running. Great. Yeah. Did you, uh, at that point, was the tipsy cast part of the curriculum? Yeah, tipsy casts. Tipsy yeah. Cast, yeah, 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 yeah. That's, yeah. Um, there are, that's a really good exercise. I've mm. been telling students to do that. You get a cast and just tip it on a weird angle and, and, and draw it. Just draw just draw a, a contour, contour drawing, a block in. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, great. Yeah. Now, Jacob Collins is the founder of GCA and one of the leading figures of the traditional realist movement today. Can you describe what it was like actually training with him while providing some insights into his personality? Okay, well, um, yeah, it's a lot, lot, lot to say. Um, yeah, J Jacob, had a, Jacob had a kind of uh, philosophical approach to the, to the, to the method. Um, I think I've mentioned it before, like when I was talking, it, it's a, it's a, it's a sort of, it's a conceptual, um, understanding of, of light and form. It's not, it's not a sense of copying the model. Mm. Um, it's a set, it's invention in a way, but you're, you're informed by, by the model. And so he would, he would talk about, you know, you have sensations, you have experiences of, of what you're seeing through your senses like you, you know, you're seeing moments on the model you're seeing color and you're seeing edges and you know mm -hmm. you're getting a sense of the form but those sensations need to need to cohere into into some kind of organizational thing so you have a you have a rational structure and that rational structure is a cons is, is the idea of, of the body right like the the sense of um of volume and anatomy and um three-dimensionality and then those those sensations that are particular to that model and to your experience can can find their way into that constructed mm. um, constructed sense uh, that represents them and makes them more them True. as individuals. So he would you talk a lot in those terms and um, uh, and you know every 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 week it would be a sort of a different theme. You know once it was about the the center line. You know the center line running through the the model, and no matter what angle you're on, you've got to find that. And and it's like traveling, traveling. Uh, you know over over terrain mm. of a landscape, and then you imagine the two halves of the body like wrapping around and meeting at the back. Mm. This is this is bisect. This line is bisecting the two halves. Sure. 
and thinking in a in a very three dimensional way, but at the same time not not um, uh, not going against the, the 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 visual sort of two dimensional plotting of points mm -hmm. on the on the on the paper. Mm -hmm. It's both. Sure. You know, and so. Um, there was just an endless amount of um, insight that he would bring. You know, you think you know what you're doing, drawing this, doing, working in this method, and he would like un like talk about another layer underneath that 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 is also there. So sure. Yeah. No, he's um, he's a, he's a really quite extraordinary teacher, and, and you know, a, a great artist. Sure. Really, um, really love his work mm -hmm. and, and, and admire him as a teacher. Great. Um, yeah. No, he's good. Yeah. <laughs> sure. Was uh, I've heard that Jacob's into conspiracy theories. Oh yes, he is into <laughs> conspiracy theories. Yeah. So he, he listen he listens to audio books all the time. Does he? When he's drawing. Okay. And uh, he's uh, he's he's quite he's he's uh, you know studied history. He's, he's he did a history degree. Hmm. Um, yeah, he's into conspiracy. I can't say much about the latest conspiracy theories he's into because I haven't seen him for a while. Sure. But, um, yeah, you're right about that. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> After three years of full-time training, you completed the core program at GCA in 2010, and with the pregnancy of your wife, you decided it was time to head back home to Cairns, yeah. Australia. Yeah. Imagine it must have been quite a challenge to leave the GCA community and all the amazing artists you were surrounded by on a daily basis. How did you find the process of arriving back in Australia and establishing yourself as a traditional painter? Yeah, well, yeah, you're right. It was definitely hard. I mean, um, such a contrast, right? New York to Cairns, mm. so, so quiet and, you know, quite far away from a lot of places. Mm. Um, um, yeah, I just tried to keep the work ethic going, you know? Um, but until until she had our baby, it was a lot easier. Then um, it became a little harder because you know you've got a lot to do to to help out and everything. But um, I still I still tried to keep it up. Um, uh, yeah, I'd, I'd go down to the beach and paint. I would you know paint portraits of you know family members and things. I was started doing a bit of teaching self portraits. Um, I entered into the Moran Prize that yeah. that year. I think that that um that she was pregnant. I think our son was born like a month later, okay. but I got in, so I did a self-portrait, like, you know, really sort of, you know, academic looking, but... Yeah, it uh, um, looks like from, you paint yourself uh, in another time. Basically. Yeah, I'm, I'm wearing some weird stuff, and mm. um, yeah, <laughs> it's a sort of uh, German romantic kind of thing, mm. maybe a medieval theme, I don't know. But anyway, uh, that got in, and, and that kind of... Um, I became a bit known after yeah. that. The people like, okay, this guy's doing this. That's different, you know. It gave, it gave me confidence to, to, you know, to, to ex exhibit and show my work. Because I didn't expect to get in at all. You, yeah. see, you see the stuff that normally gets into these prizes and that wins. It, it's not that, usually. Mm. Um, but, yeah, there's room for it. There'll, there'll be a few. And I, I, was, I was fortunate. Um, being away from the community was hard. I'd stay in touch with people as much as I could, ring them and, and uh, email and whatever. But um, yeah, I, I think it's, I don't know, it's maybe a, a necessary stage for, mm. for people to just, um, you know, step back from that and work on your own. Sure, um, sure. I, I like us, the solitude, um, but you know, I, the, the feedback is, is also good. So yeah, it, it's, it's a bit hard. I try mm. to stay in touch with those guys as much as I can. Sure. See what they're doing, and if I get a chance, go back there. And, Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Great. Yeah. Now, you work in the majority of genres of Western art, including still life, landscape, portraiture, and figurative work. Your paintings, especially your still lives, are imbued with a sense of Hindu mythology, and your inclusion of ornately patterned textiles is a trademark, trademark of your aesthetic sensibility. How did you develop this interest in Hinduism and in what ways does it influence your work? Uh, yeah, well, I was kind of aware of the, the Hindu thing from a young age. Mm -hmm. My parents had been to India and I was kind of, yeah, brought up with the stories, you know. Yeah. I was aware of the stories. We, we had um, 
you know, Krishna, Ganesha, and the Ramayana, and all of these stories, it's kind of, um, yeah, they've always been around. Uh, but I also see, I also see the gods as um, their uh, their archetypes, right? Right. Like their um, they their man their manifestation, their their representations of of um, uh, things that can't be represented. Think you know, mm. ha- powers and and qualities that um. The the the, you know, the representation is a symbol for that. Sure. Um, so yeah, I've always had that uh, influence. We we would have some uh, Indian um, mythological comics around. Oh. I read those wow. read those comics when okay. I was a kid, and you know even my son uh, reads them now. My wife's Indian as well, mm. so you know, and she she really she loves um, she loves like folk tales and stories, you know, and and the sort of lessons you can learn from 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 these stories. Sure. Um, and and um, you know we we travel to India sometimes and, and Bali and I, I like to collect um, collect sculpture. Uh, I mean I'm doing some paintings at the moment which are mostly sculptures of, of gods. Mm-hmm. It's kind of a theme at the moment. Um, I think it's, there's a sen- there's a certain presence you can get from those from those sculptures, um, which I find interesting. Mm-hmm. It, but and again, it's taking the still life into the figurative realm because they're representations of mm. of the of the human body as well. Sure, you know, so it's like there's there's an identical there's an identity of of a of a figure there right. rather than um, inanimate objects. Absolutely, you know, I, I'm I'm moving in that direction in my in my thoughts. You know, yeah. Uh, in terms of the patterns, um, yeah, you know, it's it's uh, like, I don't know, just having like pattern fabric around it's, uh, yeah I'm always collecting it and um, it finds its way into the still life I think I guess I, I guess I look for the complexity right like the the, the contrast between um, a flat pattern and a flat pattern like um, taking form and light hitting that pattern hitting that form turning the form and it's affecting the pattern which is underlying it Sure. So you got those two things going on. Okay. You know, Interesting. which is takes a long time to paint, but when when the painting's finished, it looks good. Oh, it does. So it's incredible. <laughs> yeah, that's um, really a unique part of your your painting. Yeah, that, that it's texture. it's just something I I find. I don't know. I just want to fill up this the painting. I guess I'll probably I don't know if I'll keep doing that, but you know I want to exhaust the possibilities of it at least. Sure. Um, yeah. So. So yeah, there, there's some interest there. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. Sure. In 2015, you returned to New York for a residency at the Grand Central Atelier. What made you decide that it was time to go back? Um, I'd always wanted to go back. I like when I when I left in 2013, I, I kind of told Jacob, "Look, where's there a chance to come back and do a bit more?" He said, "Yeah, sure. Whenever you want, just just come." So yeah, that was always a, a thing I wanted to do. Um, you, you know, when you when you when you're developing your drawing and painting, and, and a lot of it is um, is skill oriented. Mm-hmm. It's good to test yourself, you know, to see if if you're if you're st- if you're getting better or getting worse. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, it's good to be in an environment where you can sort of gauge, you know, um, how your work's going and, and get feedback. Sure. And look, if I if I had that the community here, it would be great. Um, but that that doesn't really exist for me, yeah. especially living there. Maybe you know if I live somewhere else, maybe. But but it definitely exists there. So I I, I went back. Um, I think for three months, and uh, yeah, just just like basically it was a residency, but I basically just re-enrolled and and just joined all the classes. Right, you know, I was, I felt different. I felt like I'm, I mean, I'm already, I was already exhibiting work and everything, and I had a, I had a big show coming up as soon as I got back, so I had, I had sort of career things going, mm. but I wanted to take that time out to, um, to yeah, to just make, make, make paintings, sure, and, and um, and sort of be in that environment where, where you're getting the feedback, mm. and you know, I, I, I'm friends with with those guys. It was, it was really nice to just reconnect. Fantastic. So, yeah. Yeah. So, so there's a model at GCA who's um, 
one of the long time models there. His name is Santiago. Santiago yeah. 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 So what's uh, is he just what's what's his story? Can you explain he's a little bit more? A, he's just a damn good model. He's, he's a really, he's good, a really model. good model. Yeah. He's a lovely guy. He's okay. one of the nicest people you'll meet. He's, wow. he's a really, really warm-hearted person. Mm -hmm. Really, uh, we all, everyone loves him. Mm. Um, yeah, I think he actually. I found out when I was there that last time that he actually um, started out kind of as an art student and then ended up wanting to model. Oh, did he? That was his way of um, getting into it. But, but he loves um, he loves Michelangelo and. Um, and he, he, he loves the sort of the contrapposto and getting in positions which are, oh, he's great which are really difficult yeah. to hold. Mm. He actually f f sort of finds it a challenge to, for himself to, and likes, likes a challenge. Mm. And uh, he, I think he really appreciates that, that the students appreciate him. I mean, it's, it's a nice relationship. He's, he's putting in that extra effort. Sure. Yeah, and, and you've, you, there's been some amazing uh, drawings and paintings of him. Oh, yeah. You know, um, yeah, 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 Miss Santiago. Oh. I've heard it said that uh, he almost looks like he's just fallen out of a nineteenth-century academic drawing. Yeah, he does. A, he does a bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah fascinating. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, your portrait of artist Ayako Sato was selected as a finalist in the two thousand and seventeen Archibald Prize. Did being selected, especially as a traditional realist, come as a surprise to you? Yeah, it did. I mean. It, you never know with the Archibald. I, I had no expectation. I had no hope because mm. I, I learned long ago like it's too emotionally draining if you, if you have expectations for yeah. these prizes <clears throat> because the criteria for which for which the paintings are judged is is not the criteria that I hold for quality in painting. Of course, yeah, it's a different set of criteria. So so I just think whatever, send it in and and. Yeah, you know, whatever. See what happens. Sure. Uh, and also, that was a commission painting. Ron and Ayako commissioned me to paint that, and and um, I did, and I yeah, I gave it to them, and uh, then entered it, and it happened to get in. So wow. it was just that was a, just a bonus, you know, because mm. it was already I did it for them, and then sure. and I thought I might as well enter it. Um, so that was great. Um, but there's always a there's always a few realist paintings in there. Mm. And the, but there's a lot of photographic looking stuff as well. There is, yeah. Uh, which which is, I'd I'd rather look at a like a messy looking painting, that's actually painted from life than a photographic looking painting that's painted yeah. from a photo because yeah. at least one of them has a, bit of life to it. Yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Um, so anyway, uh, yeah, that was that was a great experience, good exposure, and um, a lot of fun. And you know, things other things happened because of that. Sure. Which, which were which were good for me. Yeah. yeah. Well, I was definitely really happy when I looked at the uh, the finalist work and I saw your name there. Yeah. Um, thanks. Especially yeah. considering that you're an Australian painter who really represents the tradition. To have someone like you in the Archibald was um was was quite the event. So good. I was very happy for you. Yeah. That's good. Great. Yeah. I got a lot of nice feedback from it actually. It's, sure. It's good, yeah. yeah. As mentioned in the introduction, in two thousand and eighteen. You, you were awarded the William Fletcher Foundation Rome Residency, which allowed you to further your study of the European Masters for three months in Rome. Can you provide an overview of this experience and some of the discoveries you made? Uh, yeah, that's a lot. <laughs> that's a lot to talk about. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, it's, it's like the ideal place to go, really. Mm. Um, so yeah, I, I got um, I won the residency. But part of the residency is that you get to stay at the British School in Rome, which is in the Borghese Gardens, and uh, you have access to all the museums basically for free. Um, and I I had written permission to draw in the museums too, so I, yeah. I'd, I'd go and draw. And I, I sort of chose. I had to go and go to each museum and choose the things I wanted to draw and, and tell them I want to draw this statue, that statue, and, and it all changed later. But you have to sort of have a have an idea. Mm -hmm. um, and so, but when I went, I sort of thought, well, I'll I'll look at I'll look at ancient Rome, I'll look at the Renaissance, I'll look at the Baroque, I'll, you know, whatever. I look at the Grand Tour. I ended up looking mostly at ancient Rome. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Um, yeah. I. I wanted to become more familiar with that um, because that's what the Renaissance people were looking at anyway. Sure. So it was like going back to that. Mm. Um, 
another nice thing about that was having um, a lot of scholars uh, like um, classicists and archaeologists and people like that because they, they, they were staying at the British school as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I, I got along well with those guys and, and you, you know, they're steeped in ancient history. Sure. And so any any questions you have about any any aspect of ancient Rome, they're more like, more than happy to talk about it. Wow. Oh, well, so, so yeah, that was another reason to focus on 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 sort of um, you know imperial Rome because that the people around me that was their specialty, and I thought, well, yeah, I'll 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 do the, I'll draw those sculptures too because that's I'm 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 amongst that at the moment. It just sure. felt, felt right. Mm -hmm. um, there's. And and yeah, as I was saying before, like if, if you if you draw these sculptures, then you can see what what later influenced the Renaissance. Sure. And um, so yeah, now that was a seminal experience. It's something that I'll always value. It was really terrific. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the drawings you created whilst there. I mean, they're they're lovely. Uh, you know, cast drawings on tone paper, which um really show some of your you know your developed skill after your time at GCA, uh, the kind of culmination of your training. Which was was very impressive, and I understand you've um you've got a, a an exhibition plan for for, for those Ho works. Hopefully, yeah. yeah. I'm in I'm in touch with uh, one of the scholars I met over there. Who's he's Australian, but he's now at Oxford. Oh, okay. um, so he's doing his PhD, and mm -hmm. um, he's he's working out possibility of exhibiting in um, Sydney next year. So fantastic! Yeah, he's, he's he's helping me with that. Yeah. Great, good, good. Now your drawings and paintings display a fidelity to forms found in nature and the play of light which incorporates many of the traits used in the Western European academic tradition. Can you provide a description of your process to drawing and painting from life? Yeah, well, um, normally, I'll normally draw first and then, you know, that, that will, I'll, I'll trace that onto canvas and develop that into a painting. Um, not always. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, a lot of that's covered in the demo, I think. Mm. If people watch the demo, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's sort of a, um, you, you know, you start thinking about things two-dimensionally and then they develop into three dimensions and you start analysing the light. Mm -hmm. um, there's also the connection between um, colour and tone, mm -hmm. between, between chroma and... Um, and and um, and light, and how those things interact with each other. Right. Um, and then the inter intersection of, of paint quality as well, like thicker paint, thinner paint, um, those kinds of things. Um, yeah, but but yeah, I I I, I do work exclusively from life, so it, it's observational. Sure. Um, yeah. yeah. I, yeah, it's 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 a training I've had, and it's, it's what I yeah. There's a direct connection to the sure. to the thing. So whether it's a portrait or a still life or whatever. Yeah. Sure. Now earlier on, you were talking about some of the Venetian uh, methods of painting that you yes. had studied with Charlie Sheer, yeah. and I've seen the development of your paintings over time. Um, and I know a lot of the times you're be you're beginning on the brown tone canvas and uh, working up from that imatura, imprimatura yeah. into your underpainting to glazing stages. Mm. However, there was one particular painting. Uh, you had featured uh, several years ago on your Instagram page. It was a ram skull with a lovely red uh, yeah. uh, dra yeah, dra so. drapery, yeah. uh, part of the composition. Yeah, that it was, was a work in progress. Did that, you ever finish that? Yeah, I ended up like not being able to resolve it. Wow. I've still got it. I kind of, I think compositionally, it wasn't, it wasn't working. I think mm. the skull was too light, and all the tones around it were sort of mid. And it was just floating. I couldn't resolve you it. You couldn't resolve it. Okay. I've still got it. But mm. yeah, it had so much promise, right? On yeah, the red, it looked the red, great. On the red, the red the draper was yeah. beautifully painted. Yeah, I will, I'll probably do some other paintings using that method, but, but with a better thought out composition. Mm -hmm. It just, yeah, I just couldn't get it to work. And I was spending so much time and it, it, it couldn't, I thought, just leave, to abandon it. Just yeah. leave it. I might come back to it. Who knows? Sure. Yeah. Would you agree that essentially what you are trying to do is revive academic realism and a reverie for beauty and fine craftsmanship in your work? Um, well, yeah, but it's not one person can't do that. Um, it's a sort of it's a it's a you know it's a whole bunch of people that are that are yeah. all contributing their own bit to to doing that. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, of course, I want, I want to, you know. Um, 
make something beautiful. I mean, that would be like that would be great. Mm. You know, it's not it's not you know it's not it's not as easy as that. But but yeah, that's I think that's the goal. Yeah, sure. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah. You have recently developed an innovative tool for painters that is titled the Apollo Paint Carrier. Yep. I understand the genesis of the idea originated in 2013 when you were training at the Grand Central Atelier. Can you explain more about how the idea came to you? Yeah, well, um, I was, you know, every, when, you, when you're a student, you're painting every day, you're setting out your paint, you're packing it away, you know, you need somewhere to keep it. I ended up not having a very good system. Um, I think I, I was using a plastic bag at one point, which was pretty embarrassing. <laughs> anyway, I had a, I had a brush holder uh, made of canvas. And uh, yeah, I went home one night and talked to my wife and said, can you make a paint, a thing like this for paint tubes? And so we, we figured out how many tubes we wanted, how many tubes I use, I have a big one for the white. Yeah, measured it all out. Um, yeah, she, she stitched it. Um, I took it there, I was using it every day. A lot of people were interested. <laughs> they, they asked where I got it from. I said, oh, my sweater makes these. And uh, yeah, we had like 10 orders from just wow. GCA students. So, you know, we uh, she made 10 more and we sold them. And and that was pretty much it. Um, Katie Whipple bought, she's, she's a good friend of mine. She bought one. And uh, anyway, I saw her, I saw Katie last year in Rome. And uh, she said, oh, everyone always asks me about the paint carrier. You guys should, you know, really market that. And yeah, so we decided to do that. Wow. Uh, we're selling them online now. Absolutely. And, and, and in, in some art shops as well. Sure, so, sure. Yeah. Interesting, yeah. interesting. Essentially, the Apollo paint carrier is a durable canvas wrap used to store oil paints, which is especially useful for plein air painters who need to transport their materials out into the field. Is this description accurate? Uh, yeah, and um, for the studio as well. I, I mean, it's useful in the studio. If you need to find your paint, mm -hmm. you, you know exactly where it is. Sure. So not just plain air, um, definitely plain air because you're rolling it off. But, mm. but you know, I travel a lot. I like, you know, going to one city to another and, and painting. But even just keeping it in the studio, it's just, just, it's just very useful. It's very, like, keeps your paint organized. You know where everything is. Yeah. Looks, looks nice. Yeah and, yeah, and sometimes when you're stacking your paint in the little box, it tends to get a bit uh, icky, you know. Sure. Yeah, yeah they, they dent each other sometimes, and, and you, you just can't find the color you're looking for. So, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's great. It's a nice organizational yeah, yeah. Uh, tool. Yeah, no, as well. it's, it's a, it, looks, yeah, it looks good as well. It so, does, but, yeah. But it looks really yeah. nice. Mm. Now, approaching the end of the interview, today you live in Trinity Beach, Queensland, with your wife, Shweta, and your two children, Ruben and Jasmine. Yep. What are your plans for the future? Ah, yes, I didn't think about that. Um, well, uh, continuing, um, continuing painting and drawing, obviously. Um, uh, opportunities to exhibit will be, you know, coming up. Uh, but I think developing the work is the, is the, my, is the main thing. Um, I'm going to keep doing uh, portraits and still life and, and figures. Um, but yeah, another thing I've been developing is um, starting starting not not from observation but from imagination. Oh, imaginative right. painting. Yeah, well, at least drawing to begin with, um, inventing inventing scenes, uh, mm. narratives. Um, uh, I've I've been doing I've been doing a lot of sketching like that, and I, and I yeah. think these things will eventually become compositions with with several figures. Yeah, which, which I will, which I will employ models for and paint, but but uh, subordinated to the idea that, that came from from sketching. Sure, and you've you've yeah. dabbled with that in the past because uh, there's one painting I see I've seen which isn't really featured on your website. Uh, it's kind of a, a, a gentleman wearing a like a, a, a hood or a piece of drapery over over uh, his yeah, head. Yeah, wow, well, you've seen that one, yeah. And uh, <laughs> yeah. it's sort of in this desert sort of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Scene. I, that yeah. was a um, yeah, that was a model I hired, and that, that the theme of that was um, that was a, for the for a, a religious art prize in Perth, the Mandola. Mm. It was um, Elijah, Elijah, in oh, the, Elijah in the desert. Beautiful. Um, yeah. There's this small still voice. Okay, I think. lovely. Um, 
anyway, um, I thought I'd win that prize, but I didn't. <laughs> so, but it was a good experience because that did start from sketches, and I, I, I invented the landscape and I dressed him up in, in biblical clothes. So yeah, I, I you know, I, th I think um, it's nice to be able to to push. To, to not be tied to just observing. Yeah. It's great to know how to do that, and it's good for certain genres, but um, if you look at this, the span of, of, of art history and, and culture in general, it's essentially telling stories. Mm -hmm. And um, you're limited if all you can do is copy what's in front of you. So Sure. So that's something that, which is very different from all the training I've done, but it, well, I want to develop that. Yeah. And, and then combine it with it. Sure, and that, and that shows uh, you know, some of your mileage as well. I mean, you've come through the whole academic training, and now you're starting to come into your own. Sure, well, yeah, you've got to do it at some point. Yeah, yeah <laughs> so, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, yeah. very good. Now, before we conclude, Andrew, I understand you've brought a Apollo paint carrier uh, with you today. Yes, I actually uh, do. Would you like to share it with viewers? With the viewers, yes. So this is how it looks like when it's rolled up. This is the one I use, so they're not all as dirty as this. This is one that has paint on it. Um, so here we go, it unrolls like this, okay, um, you can fit all your tubes, you've got 18 tubes, these fit 37 to 60 mil tubes, uh, the big pocket fits a, a big tube uh, up to 225 mils, this is three layers of cotton canvas, and then the extra layer of the pockets, uh, double stitched all around, double stitched here and here, it's a uh, very sturdy. They um, they are machine washable. Um, they're uh, they're very strong. They'll last you forever. Um, and here's our, our logo on the back. Mm. Yeah, that's fascinating. How did you come up with the title Apollo uh, Paint Carrier? Uh, well, it's always good to have you know uh, a god's name. I think on <laughs> on your product. Sure. Um, it's classical, right? Mm. Apollo, Apollo is is um, if any god is, is classical, it's him. Mm -hmm. uh, reason, enlightenment, um, distinction between forms, mm -hmm. um, mus you know, musical uh, and poetic inspiration, mm -hmm. uh, light. These are these are the some of the things that are associated and precision, like you know, bow and arrow. Sure. These are some of the things that are associated with them, and it just seemed right. Mm -hmm. We had a, we had a lot of other names. That that, that one seems seems right. Mm -hmm. It rolls like this, um, and uh, tip it like that. Um, the tubes don't fall out. Fantastic. Yeah, and I've got. I'll show you the colours. Yeah, lovely. So blue. Yeah, I've got the green. Got the grey. And the cream. So if you're interested, these are all available on our website. It's apollopaintcarrier.com. Very nice. And in art, some art stores as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what do they retail for? Uh, uh, these are $89. $89, retail, yeah. yeah. Well, that's, that's pretty affordable for a, a tool which is going to really protect your paints and help you, you know, be more, um, help you transport your paints a lot more easier. Uh, sure. and keep organized yeah, and yeah. something that's washable I mean it could last you a lifetime well that's the idea we made a quality product you don't have to buy it twice mm -hmm. you, you, you get it once and it's gonna it's gonna last so very nice so, yeah. so do you plan on uh, since now you've entered into the art material realm of the business do, do you intend on <laughs> creating more art, art related um, products I'd rather not, rather not? <laughs> so, <laughs> we might we might make a brush we might make a brush carrier as brush well. carrier as well, like yeah. a really good brush carry with with the right size pockets and nice. everything. Yeah. is similar to this. Um, look, it's it's not it's not it's not really something I want to do that much. I mean, it's I'm pr we're, I'm proud we're proud of this. My oh, wife yeah. and I have done it. It's a lovely product. Yeah. Um, but you know, painting is is the main thing. Um, you know, we'll we'll see what happens with this. I mean, it's doing well. People people like it and they're they're buying it. So you know, we're we're very happy with that. Mm -hmm. um, but but yeah, it's it's not. It, I don't want to definitely necessarily expand into lots of products. But sure. But yeah, we'll see if there's if there's a demand for something, and and you know, we can make it well. Then then yeah, we'll mm. we might go ahead with it. Yeah, yeah sure. Well, congratulations. Yeah. I think it's a great product. Thanks a lot. And um, I'm I'm really happy that it's a you know it's an Australian painter making a, a product 
for for painters. Well, yeah, it, yeah. it came out of necessity. It was we, mm. we, you know, I designed it and I asked other friends, you know, how would you like it? How many pockets? And we we sort of talked about it. And yeah, it's it's you know made made by artists for artists. Fantastic. Yeah. Lovely. Yeah. Great. Yeah. In conclusion, I recall the 2014 Amy Barrel Travelling Scholarship and Art Prize Exhibition of Finalists in which you were featured in. One of the works you had included in the exhibition was a cast drawing of Disco Bollas, which you completed when you were a student at the Grand Central Atelier. I must have returned to that drawing around three or four times to the, to the impact, due to the impact it had on me. It was the first time I had ever seen a cast drawing before. I heard that the GCA casts were very refined and I had seen some examples on the internet. However, nothing could compare to seeing that drawing in life. <laughs> the sheer comprehension of form was remarkable. Every inch of the drawing was executed with the utmost sensitivity and you could re really tell that you had made some real discoveries in your training throughout this drawing. I can't imagine the amount of hours you must have put into the drawing but I'm guessing it must have been somewhere between 50 to 60. Can you elaborate on the uh, process of creating this particular drawing? Well, first of all, thanks. Thanks a lot for saying that. That's really nice. Um, it, it was a lot more than 50 or 60 hours. Wow. It was, <laughs> <laughs> it was uh, I was learning. So, you know, and as I said, everyone was working, you know, methodically and quite slowly. Uh, it was a few months, I would say. That's incredible. That, yeah. Wow. But um, yeah, it, it was a nice result. I'm, I'm glad. I'm glad you. I'm glad it, 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 it meant something to you, and you it, appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, it was. It was quite the uh, quite the day. I remember seeing that. I'm glad. That, I'm glad. Uh, it's not yet. Yeah. Cast drawing. It's quite breathtaking. I, it almost when you observe it, you'd imagine that you must have been holding your breath every time you placed that. Yeah, it was, it was, yeah, it was a bit like that for yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. Definitely. Yeah, yeah, well, congratulations. Yeah. That's a lovely, lovely drawing. Yeah, thanks. What comes of that drawing today? Is it in your collection? It's in a private collection. Private yeah, collection. Someone, someone bought it. Yeah. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. That's great. Well, Andrew, thank you so very much for your time today. I believe you have a very bright future ahead of you, and I look forward to seeing more of your work as you continue to develop your practice. Would you like to state your contact details so viewers can get in touch with you and also explain? How, how viewers can purchase an Apollo paint carrier, and I believe you've already yeah. mentioned that, which is just through the Apollo sure. paint carrier website. Yeah, the website. We're on Instagram to Apollo paint carrier. Um, I'm on Instagram, Andrew underscore Bono. Uh, my website, www.andrewbonoart.com. Um, yeah, that's that's it. If you want to find me, you can find me. I'll, I'll happily talk to people. So... Um, Thank you for the interview. No worries, Andrew. Thank you very much. Yeah, and uh, yeah. I look forward to following your work into the future. Right. And uh, we'll catch up again one day and uh, see how your, your work is progressing. Absolutely. Look All forward right. to it. Great. Thanks, yeah. Andrew. That's okay.